I think everyone is joining now. Good morning, everyone. And welcome. It's so exciting to have you all join us. And I know folks are joining uh, as I'm beginning to speak here. Uh, but thank you all for being with us today. I'm so pleased that we can gather, uh, albeit that we're still virtual, uh, but it's so great to be able to come together to learn from one another and take action on the future of public health, which is a critical topic for each of us and everyone in our nation. I'm excited because we have an excellent agenda planned for the third session of the Lights, Camera, Action, the Future of Public Health series. Our first summit focused on the public health workforce and included a robust discussion and extensive participation through the chat. Our team summarized the plenary and breakout group discussions, organized the rich content from the chat, and have posted a report along with the recording on our Future of Public Health website. Our second summit focused on creating effective, equitable, modernized public health data systems. Harnessing the power of today's technology to collect and analyze data in a timely fashion to manage public health threats is a key action as we imagine the future of public health. The recording for the second summit is also available at thefutureofpublichealth.org. Today's summit will focus on three important topics, public health governance, law, and finance. Although we are considering them separately, they are very much intertwined and the backbone of our public health systems. Real life examples bring issues to life for me. So let's think about our drinking water, which illustrates very nicely the interrelationship of governance, law, and finance. So today, most, though I stress not all of us, take for granted that the water uh, from our taps is safe to drink that it's free from infectious and environmental contaminants. Most of us also know there is a local government authority that routinely samples and monitors the water to maintain its safety. Financing of safe water comes from federal, state, and local jurisdictions. And most of us receive a bill from our local water authority that helps pay for the cost of the safe water. Now, this wasn't always the case. Before the passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972, safe drinking water was not a guarantee. This public health guarantee of safe drinking water also illustrates that constant vigilance and monitoring are needed. Otherwise, critical infrastructure failures in safety can occur as happened in the lead contaminated drinking water crisis in Flint, Michigan. So for purposes of today's summit, let's define each of these components. First, governance provides the context, how public health functions in a jurisdiction. There are many ways to practice public health, and these governance structures and strategies vary widely across the United States. Second, public health law provides the legal guidance and authority required for healthy communities. We benefit from the public health laws and regulations ensuring that we have clean drinking water, as I already mentioned, and that our food is safe to eat. Public health laws can also help to make good health and opportunity available to all. And third, financing supports the skilled workforce, the state of science laboratories, and the forward-leaning programs, in essence, the mechanics of public health. So as we will hear today, financing a community's health and well-being is not the responsibility of public health alone, but other public and private sectors play an important role. So to focus on what's most important in these three areas, we engaged with several prominent colleagues in these respective fields, experts from the Georgia Health Policy Center and the Network for Public Health Law and Change Lab Solutions. They have helped identify areas where pivotal actions can change the future of public health. In keeping with the great analogy provided to us by Renee Kennedy, CEO of the Michigan Public Health Institute, during our first summit in this series, which we focused on the public health workforce, um, she, we have really come to think about these summits as the opportunity to have a family meeting, a safe place to share diverse and different opinions and come up with agreed upon actions. So today's topics each have its own challenging set of issues. As with the rules for a family meeting, 
We have to be open to hearing opinions that are different from our own and potentially different from the way things have always been done. We have asked each of our panelists to acknowledge these challenges and differences in opinion and like those family meetings, suggest ways to move forward. So before we start with our first panel, let me take a moment to highlight some of these challenges and tensions. Starting with governance. We know our governance practices differ considerably from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, making any generalizations on governance very difficult. In my own experience in Indiana, where I served as a state health official for many years, public health is managed locally. Indiana is known as a home rule state. And as a result, the local health department funding control in Indiana rests with the city councils, which also includes things like the caps on salaries, which may have implications for the ability to attract talent to the local health departments. Interestingly, I'm now back in Indiana serving on a commission established by Governor Holcomb to chart a course for the future of public health in Indiana. In our deliberations around governance, we are looking at the advantages and disadvantages of the decentralized model. A disadvantage is the uneven availability of public health services across the state. So we are conducting numerous public listening sessions across the state to constructively hear all sides of the issues that we're taking on. And then moving to law and policy. During the past two years, we know that existing public health authority has been questioned. And in some cases, laws have been revised that will now limit the, public, uh, the practice of public health and public health authority. The major tenet of public health is the common good for the community, which at times, and more so during emergency situations, may impede upon people's individual liberties. The tension that has been created has been increased as a result of this pandemic. And working to successfully navigate this tension is not new in public health. We have done this often in our community work to prevent chronic diseases, control infectious diseases, provide safe drinking water, safe food, and much more. I believe we collectively are healthier for this work and the foresight and leadership on the part of our public health and elected leaders who have made these decisions over the past century. We also need to note that many public health achievements are grounded in evidence-based regulatory actions and laws that have strong community acceptance and support, such as legislation for seatbelt laws, automobile safety regulations, smoke-free policies, and environmental protections. In reflecting on the family meeting concept, bringing together different and diverse thoughts is important to coming up with laws and regulations that are transparent and community driven. And then lastly, thinking about finance. In the past year, we have seen an unprecedented flow of federal funds to state and local public health from the Congressional Relief Acts. This influx has resulted in a web of financial resources that is growing in size and complexity almost daily. The challenge for public health leaders is to recognize, assemble, and sustainably deploy these financial resources. The new funding provides the opportunity to demonstrate the value of public health actions to the public. For the first time in decades, these resources provide public health the financial leverage to incentivize other governmental sectors to together think creatively and strategically about how to braid and blend dollars to improve their community's well being. Today, we will explore the current unprecedented federal funding, learn more about how to see the money in the system and some of the methods to support financing population health. I wanna take a moment now to recognize our partners, United Health Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the Pew Charitable Trust for stepping forward to provide initial support for the Lights Camera Action Summit Series. Their support is helping to catalyze activities needed to propel positive action, rebuild confidence, foster health equity, and transform our nation's public health system. I also want to acknowledge and thank our co-hosts, including the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, or ASTO, the National Association of County and City Health Officials, known as NACHO, and the Big Cities Health Coalition. Before we get started, I want to let you know we are using the polling questions and live chat in a different way at this summit. As we did in Summit 1 and 2, we will have four real-time polling questions that I will introduce. And additionally, we will also post to the chat three questions for audience input. 
Behind the scenes, we have experts in governance, law, and finance who will capture the responses to the polling and the chat questions. In the closing reflective panel, I will use some of these responses from you coming from the chat and the polling from the questions to our reflective panel experts uh, as we reflect on the day. So now I wanna to turn to my friend and colleague, Kay Bender, current president of the American Public Health Association. Kay has extensive experience in governmental public health and will chair the first plenary on public health governance. Before we introduce the panel, I would like to give Kay the opportunity to set the stage for governance, speaking to the challenges public health is experiencing and her thoughts about charting the course going forward. So Kay, over to you. Thank you, Judy. Um, and it's great to be with the public health family today. So I'm glad, Judy, that, um, that you called us public health family. I uh, do represent the American Public Health Association today. So on behalf of APHA, I want to echo Dr. Monroe's comments about how excited we are to be part of this webinar series. Couldn't be any more timely. These topics are so foundational to the work of public health systems um, throughout the country. And, and my career, long career in public health, um, I've observed that when governance, law, and finance are in order and operating efficiently, they form the basis for the rest of the public health work. But when they don't work, we see how they disrupt the best plan, public, public health programs and services. We've also learned a lot during the pandemic, both good and not so good, about how these three areas align in support of public health's mission. I know that um, many of you um, are excited, like I am, that we're coming together for this conversation at this time about how we can best use some of the learnings from the pandemic and just from the past to make our public health system stronger for the future. I think this is extremely important as we consider the chief health strategist role um, that we talk about so often. But when I think about the challenges in these three areas over the course of my career, both in state and local government and at the national level, I'm reminded just as Dr. Monroe said, how diverse our public health system is. The way we organize governmental public health across the country is varied. And we have spent a lot of time pondering which of those structures work the best. Today, I wonder, though, if we've been pondering the wrong questions, especially in today's environment, and especially in light of our health strategist role. So as we do transition in a moment to the panel discussions, I leave you with some food for thought to hopefully stimulate your thinking about how we might can work better and how we might can envision our future a little differently. So what if we were able to bring disparate groups together in the area of, of governance and law and finance to really focus collectively on the big picture? as we work with our policymakers and our governance officials. I'm quoting Vincent LaFranza from an MPHI here where I heard him recently ask whether we could keep our eyes on creating the conditions in which people can be healthy rather than majoring in the minors about standardizing how we do that. We all know that there's multiple ways to do public health well. And we should look at innovations and emerging practices, but we do so to inform our work and not to regulate it. What if we treated the conflicts that we've encountered between governmental public health and some of our elected leaders in home rule jurisdictions? I work in one of those, those who champion states' rights, as we treat working with diverse cultures and diverse communities. 
This approach encourages us to learn what makes those policymakers tick in order to reach common ground. And I'll tell you just a real short personal story. Now that I'm back in Mississippi and back in a very strong states' rights state, I um, had an occasion just last week um, to meet with a health professional group, um, and the conversation that I was facilitating was about what have we learned in our state from the pandemic. And most of us could agree about most things we've learned for the, from the pandemic until I got to the point of talking about how much better it may have been if we'd have had a plan to address the pandemic from the beginning um, that was standardized enough um, that every state, every local jurisdiction would have been able to have had that plan in front of them and execute it about the same throughout the country. And I got pushback um, from one of the people uh, on the board of this group that I was talking about. And he said, oh, no, I don't think that would have been a good idea because that just leads us to federalizing public health. And, you know, okay, I'm a state's rights person. And I said, yes, I do know that. And I also know that, I think I know that you're an educated professional and you want to make the best decisions for our state based on the best evidence. And wouldn't it have been nice if we could have had a conversation about what is the best evidence and how you make those decisions? Now, and I know that a lot of jurisdictions across the country did that. And we had a nice conversation. We reached common ground uh, in a real short period of time, which is kind of unusual. Um, but when we talked about doing the best to ensure the conditions in which people can be healthy in the state. And what if we thought about how to be accountable for the public health authorities that we've been granted in governmental public health through laws, rules, and regulations in ways that aren't perceived as heavy government, but helpful government. So it challenges as we move forward and we rebuild, strengthen, and modernize our public health system that we have to build back the trust in government. And that means trust in governance. That means trust in laws, and that means trust in those finances. And that may mean that we have to see more innovative ways to do the job well while being open to doing the job differently. I think our public health family will be stronger because of the action items that emerged from the, today's discussion. Georges Benjamin, who of course is the executive director of APHA, in the first national summit recommended we build strong relationships with policymakers in what I call off season. It's not the time to be creating new relationships when we're in the midst of a crisis. So this is important work that we need to do every day to strengthen our understanding of each other's point of view. So with that, I look forward to um, being back with you in just a moment um, to introduce our first panel. So Dutch Monroe, back to you. Yeah, well, thank, thank you, Kay. And it's so great to hear your insight uh, at, and, and many years that you've, uh, uh, your career has intertwined with public health governance. Uh, so before we hear from our first panel, we're gonna pause now and take our quick poll on governance priorities. So with our first poll question, uh, the question is, which aspect of governance would you prioritize to help strengthen the public health field? Please choose one of these answers. Um, and if you have another idea that's not listed here to, uh, as one of the answers, uh, you can go ahead and select other and then put your priority into chat. Please don't be shy about any new ideas in the chat. And we're gonna take, uh, a moment here to let you answer um, 
before uh, we pull up the poll poll results here. Okay, we should be having results here momentarily. And here we go. And it looks uh, no, we may have a we may have a tie here. Twenty seven percent clear, effective communications and equitable and inclusive community engagement uh, are our leads uh, lead answers. But uh, there's quite a distribution there. OK, so now um, it's my pleasure to move to our first panel. Uh, titled Visioning the Future of Public Health, Strengthening Governance and the Law. So remember, you can participate in the discussion by posting relevant comments in the chat. We will post a question for you to answer in the chat as well. And finally, our team will be posting live on social media during the sessions today. So if you want to share any social media on your own channels, use hashtag LCA Summit. So Kay, uh, back to you uh, to moderate our first panel. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. All right, I am very pleased to present to you our first set of panelists. Um, and I could talk the rest of the day about each of them, but I won't do that. I'm just going to uh, introduce them by the title and then you can check their bios out in the materials. So with us today to talk about visioning the future of public health, strengthening governance and law. We have Scott Hall, who is from the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce, Claude Jacob from San Antonio Metropolitan Health District, Jose Montero, who is, we all know Jose, from the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CSILS. And we have Aisha Pomuko, who is from the San Francisco Foundation. Elke Shaw Tulloch from the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. And I'm going to do my best to uh, do a good job moderating this panel. So, as we go into the panel objectives, um, we're going to highlight inclusive and effective governance practices, identify ways and examples of strengthening business and community organizations role in public health, that's why we have both government and uh, non-government um, representatives on this panel, and then highlight examples of cross-sector approaches to strengthening public health. Um, so as we begin, I want to start um, with federal level and call on um, Jose Montero with our first question. Um, as a public health leader at the federal level, um, what aspects of government governance have you seen work and what didn't work as well during the pandemic? Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for, for that question. Talking about governance with, uh, within a decentralized system is quite a challenge. Uh, but, but looking at the answers from, from the poll where we see communication and community engagement, uh, those have been two areas where we clearly need to figure out how to do better. When I look at governance as all of these actions and manners in that we govern, uh, what are the organizations and how we operate, knowing that public health is what we as a society do collectively to assure conditions for people to be healthy, looking at the federal level, it is amazing the type of work and the quality of the work that happened. I know that many people will not share that view, but if, if we look not with the hyper-partisan eye that sometimes this gets discussed, but with the reality of developing a vaccine, an amount of tests, being able to vac vaccinate hundreds of millions of people uh, in this time frame, and how many lives were saved, there was a lot that happened. But at the same time, it brings to the forefront for the general public to recognize that public health is not one agency or one person. It is a system where the federal government need to come together. And you can argue how successful, but clearly we vaccinate, we develop the systems. And then in, within that, we had to bring partners uh, that were not federal agencies. So we had contracts with pharmacies and healthcare systems and others. 
But at the end of the day, it was the jurisdictions, the local, state, tribal, territorial health departments, the ones who implemented all of these different things that we were thinking about. And each one of us played a different role at different times. The thing that I can believe we should do better is the engagement of the public. The public finally saw what public health is about, and maybe they were not ready. Or maybe we wanted changes that were too fast, too quick uh, in, in the pandemic context. Public health has always been and always be political because it's public policy. It, it's not a technocratic domain. It is a public domain, but the public was missing in some of the discussions and decisions. So if it, public health is to be all what we as a society do, we need to figure out how to bring that public and incorporate their thoughts. For tobacco, we did it, but it took us years. For HIV or STD preventions, we have done that successfully, but it took us years. Is this the centralized approach, the one that is tricky to present, tricky to explain, and we have a lot of room for improvement? Thank you, Dr. Pantera. Uh, great examples and good reflections on the fact that we do have some successes even though they did take years, they, we can learn from those. So I'm gonna move now to Elke um, to give the same perspective. Elke? Great, thank you very much, Kay. Um, I, I really appreciate a lot of the comments from Jose. Um, I think that those are some of the big lessons learned that we've had throughout the course of the pandemic as well. And I'll, I'll set the stage a little bit by um, starting out with saying that just like Dr. Monroe stated in the very beginning, Idaho, which is where I'm from, is very much like Indiana, where it's a local control state. Um, we have a decentralized public health system here in the state. and something that became incredibly clear we've always you know fancied ourselves as being great conveners of partners and bringing people together to problem solve but throughout the course of the pandemic that was just completely magnified and um and the need to bring in a wide variety of partners and voices to the table to problem solve has been really incredibly um precious to us and and fruitful um as we're trying to solve for some of these problems, you know, we've got state and local, not only policies that sometimes are in conflict, but also politics, of course, are incredibly um, challenging. And so we, throughout the course of the pandemic, established many, <clears throat> excuse me, multi-sector groups, and they helped us with, um, from just the basic rollout of uh, the pandemic response as we worked with our state and local public health agencies combined, to coordinate all aspects, but we also really worked hand in glove with our Idaho Office of Emergency Management, our Idaho Hospital Association, our governor's office. We've been in constant communication throughout this whole thing, I'm sure like every other state. But we also found um, when we're trying to roll out aspects of the response, some things that um, were really important, of course, were transparency that was helping to build confidence. So we have some other examples that I wanted to share um, of things that we've done throughout the course. So in the very early days, we quickly developed several groups to help us um, with key uh, areas. So we developed, we call them, probably misnaming them, but strike teams and, and task force along the way, but we addressed long-term care facilities, uh, testing schools, our disaster medical advisory committee working on crisis standards of care. We convened a health equity task force. So those were all bringing in a multi-sector um, problem solvers, but one that was really fruitful for us was around our vaccine distribution and bringing in an advisory committee. And that's where the and bringing in the public has also been incredibly helpful. We had a wide variety of um, partners and from its agencies, but also local response agencies, local businesses, um, and the public themselves that really helped us prioritize who should get vaccines in the early days and make those recommendations to the governor. And almost without question, uh, every single one of those were vetted so well that we were able to move forward very quickly and he accepted those recommendations. And then just as we continue throughout the pandemic, bringing together every single hospital across the state on pretty much a daily basis to problem solve and working on key issues like our critical blood supply uh, issues that we're having. It's that multi-sector um, partnerships and strategies and transparent and, uh, and constant communication that's really helped us navigate that 
kind of the political and policy differences that we see uh, across the state. Gosh, that's well said, Elke, that navigating those differences. Um, we'll come back to that in a little bit, but let's hear from Claude Jacob, local level, big San Antonio Health Department. So, uh, Claude, what say you on this topic? Well, thank you, Kay, and it's a pleasure to be here with my esteemed colleagues. So, just picking up on Elke and Dr. Montero's comments, um, just on the ground, thematically, while it's been all COVID all the time, the last couple of years, there are nuances, as you've heard from Elke, about how each state is organized and how that translates on the ground. But thematically, there are three A's we think about the experiences we've had. It's about leveraging the assets on the ground. It's about becoming better ambassadors. But at the end of the day, it's about the alignment of our efforts given the limited resources that are available. So first we have to go to the places where community members are rather than expect them to come to us. Um, so this is a crucial step in building trust. Uh, people need to see you where they live, work, play, or pray. And so just know that in terms of the multi-sectoral cross-sector collaborations, that's thematically something we've seen on the ground over the course of the last couple of years and been magnified through this COVID experience. Uh, next, we have, to, we have to recognize that uh, historically marginalized communities are resourceful, organized, and, a and reflect a tremendous diversity of experience, perspectives, and interests. And so, again, tapping into these assets, community members will have their own competing priorities given limited resources but can bring a much needed sense of urgency and high level awareness about the stakes involved um, at, on any given issue. So what we've experienced through this COVID storm is that conditions have been magnified, have been exacerbated uh, because of this global pandemic. So with that, we are tapping into the, access, the assets, the expertise on the ground. And that's something that I've seen here in sunny San Antonio. Just know that we are a district-wide model uh, anchored to the city, but we serve the broader Bear County. Uh, we are the seventh largest city in the United States, uh, but just know our jurisdiction tops two mil. So with that, recognizing lessons learned, the last thing that we would mention that I would mention is that we have to create platforms uh, where people as experts of their own right can share their perspectives, experiences, and ideas that are on par with practitioners and technical experts. And this is a key um, that we demonstrated that we're finding to, to provide clear value on the ground. So. The framework of the seven principles of the chief health strategist, just know that this is something that I've seen play out over the course of these many months that I've been down here, but just know that this ties into a broader narrative that where we leverage these assets, that we make sure that we deputize uh, uh, supporters and stakeholders on the ground to be ambassadors of our work. But at the end of the day, it's about alignment, 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 so that we don't diverge and diverge our limited resources, but, but that we converge and we can be more responsive to the crises on the ground. Just know that we tend not to move at the speed of change as a discipline, yet our agility has been our best asset through this pandemic. So I'll stop there and just say thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, again, bidding you greetings from the nationally accredited Metro Health Department. Thank you and thanks to all three. Before I turn to our non-governmental uh, partners for, um, for their perspective, I just wanna I say to all of you on this webinar today who do work in um, states where local home rule is so strong and states' rights are so important, you have just heard from several, beginning with Dr. Monroe to myself to Elke to Claudia Jacob, and then Jose Montero representing CDC who has to look at all of that. You've just heard from several strong home rule states' rights states with success stories. And so take heart um, in that and, and listen back to, I love what um, Claude said about um, alignment efforts and, and really working um, on those ahead of time. Uh, but we can't, do this in isolation of our business partners and our nonprofits. And so, um, Scott, we'll turn to you. You've heard this discussion now about how communities came to uh, gather in different ways to help each other during the pandemic. Based on your leadership and your um, eagle's nest, um, being outside of government, 
What's your advice for how we can strengthen partnership with businesses? Yeah, thanks, Kay. That's, it's a great question. It's great to be with you this morning. It's great to be with all of you this morning. Scott Hall, Senior Vice President with the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce. You all, most of you, will forget more about public health during this session than I will ever know. But we are, at the Chamber, a proud partner of our public health infrastructure and network in the Greater Kansas City metro area. And that really begins uh, with relationships. That's the nature of our business. We've been very fortunate in the Greater Kansas City Metro, and I think it's fascinating to hear Claude speak because Claude's city, San Antonio, is similar in size in a, at a metro level to Kansas City, but very different in the sense that Kansas City, Missouri, the center city in our metro, is not nearly the size of San Antonio. And so we have a much more fractured uh, political system, including a, a metro area that straddles a state line. And that makes all of this very complicated. But it begins in Kansas City the same way it begins in San Antonio and everywhere that's represented on this call today, and that's with relationships. We have been very fortunate to work closely with a number of public health experts in the greater Kansas City metro area, especially the Kansas City, Missouri Health Department over the last really 30 years on a number of different things. And those relationships were tested, but then uh, important as the pandemic began. Our relationship, especially with Dr. Rex Archer, who was the, uh, at the time, the uh, director of the Kansas City, Missouri Health Department was crucial in getting effective messaging out to our members, our business members, our nonprofit members. And, you know, I, I was thinking about how you build those relationships. And it's not rocket science. Uh, public health experts, public health departments can work with their business community on public policy. And we have certainly done that in Kansas City. Many of you have done that in your hometowns too. You can co-host events. In fact, the Friday before the chamber sent everyone home from work, we were hosting an event and Dr. Archer was the keynote speaker. And about a week out, we changed the format of that event so he would speak exclusively on COVID. And it was wonderful to have a relationship with him strong enough that we could have that on the, on the calendar and then pivot accordingly. And then the other thing I would suggest is that people, um, people can present at meetings. They can present at board meetings of chambers of commerce and they can present at health commission meetings and inviting your business community, your chamber or other community, uh, business community representatives to present at some of these meetings um, about the things they're doing in public health is a great opportunity to build some of those relationships. You know, we always say here that relationships build trust and trust builds collective action. And that is, the secret sauce to any effective response to a community crisis, whether it be a pandemic or another public health crisis or something else like a social driver of health. I know we're gonna, we're gonna talk about some of those things. And honestly, there have been some social driver of health crises uh, during this pandemic that have been focuses for both our public health department and our business community. Um, As examples of how you've seen this work in greater Kansas City, um, we have seen uh, a tremendous uh, partnership between our businesses and public health, and specifically in some of the action our businesses have taken at the request of our public health leaders. That includes PPE production from people who don't make PPE or didn't uh, until the first part of 2020. We've seen it in resource preservation the change in behavior in business is not always something that happens easily, but many of our business members uh, began to use things differently or uh, use people differently, um, just like we are right now. And that was informed by public health and in partnership with public health. And finally, the policies we have used around our employees, whether it's testing, vaccination requirements, screening for uh, 
COVID-19 or other policies implemented at an organizational level have all been informed by public health and will con continue to need to be so. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Scott. Uh, you know, um, that's not the first time I've heard you talk about this. Uh, Scott, one of the things I so appreciate about the way you bring the message forward is your consistency. Um, uh, and that means a lot to those of us in public health who are seeking advice. Um, so now let's turn to Aisha um, from the San Francisco Foundation. Same question, um, but from the nonprofit uh, foundation perspective, what, um, what are your observations? Aisha? Thanks so much, Kay. Um, it's fabulous to be here with everybody and so good to see so many familiar faces and names um, up on my screen and in the chat. So um, today I'm gonna speak to um, a couple of perspectives, um, speaking from the local and regional perspective in the Bay Area um, region of California um, and speaking to um, kind of a hybrid perspective of uh, what philanthropy can do um, armed with the tools of policy and capacity building uh, working hand in hand with our nonprofit and government partners. Um, so, you know, I saw in the chat that um, folks were very interested in the theme of community engagement. Um, and that's a big theme for us as well. And in fact, you know, at the policy fund at the San Francisco Foundation, we were, we're really leading an experiment and that's, can we go beyond community engaged policy to actually community led and community drafted policy? Um, so I want to lift up some of the innovative uh, governance practices and relationships that we are seeing at the local level from our perspective um, at the Policy Fund at the San Francisco Foundation. And, and what we're seeing is, you know, at the simplest level, when you really center community members who have been left out of the policy process for so long, we actually end up with policies that are not only more inclusive, but more effective. Um, and when we talk about folks who've been left out of the policy process, um, you know, these are folks who often aren't used to being heard, even at the local level, where governments are often closest to their communities. So we're talking folks like people of color, immigrants, low income folks, tenants. Uh, so really, our work is to make sure that local governments have the capacity and tools to create policy solutions that are actually designed by the constituents whose voices have been most marginalized. Um, and the key tool here uh, to pick up a theme from Scott is the relationships that they have and build um, with community leaders, nonprofit leaders, who are the trusted messengers um, in these marginalized communities. And, and what I love so much about this, about inviting in nonprofit leaders into the governance process, is it, it challenges a lot of notion about, you know, what our proper roles are. It challenges the notion that governance is just for electeds. Policy is just for bureaucrats. Public health is just for health departments, right? We know that isn't so. So we invite the community into the governance process as co-creators. And so what this looks like is under our model, the policy fund provides support to local governments across the Bay Area to commit to a two-year partnership with a grassroots community organization to design and pass a policy that centers racial and economic and health justice. And what we've found is really exciting because we're seeing that not only does this have a transformative effect on the policy created, but actually the policy and governance process itself. So we're seeing that we not only get better policies out of this, but in fact, we're transforming the way that policy is done, the way business as usual is conducted. And, and I want to stress, um, you know, that this sounds great talking about it and it sounds good on paper, but of course this work can be uncomfortable, right? Um, our colleagues in government, our colleagues um, as community advocates, many of these groups are actually not accustomed to collaborating. And, and in fact, it's fair to say sometimes these groups actually have to overcome um, sometimes adversarial histories of, you know, feeling like they're on different sides of a difficult conversation. So, so in my work facilitating community directed um, local policy change, I really encourage folks to embrace tension as a natural and healthy part of the process um, and really challenge our friends in local government um, to go beyond business as usual levels of community engagement 
and actually cede power to community members to set policy priorities and provisions. And what we've been seeing is really exciting because you know, not only are we seeing that during this two-year process, we've made huge progress towards ambitious policy packages, um, but during our program, of course, what happened over the last two years? A massive racial justice mobilization across the United States, um, a novel coronavirus that we're still responding to. And we saw that our community partners working hand in hand with partners actually allowed folks to pivot to a much more effective emergency response during COVID. Our nonprofit community partners were ready to mobilize as trusted messengers and ambassadors to the community, able to provide services in language, deliver emergency assistance to renters at risk of eviction, to educate the community about uh, complex emerging uh, policy priorities. So we've been seeing that the, the key to some of the policy innovations that we're trying to catalyze is these strong relationships between folks in government and folks outside of government in the community advocacy space and inviting them all to the same table to co-create, to weather some of this healthy tension together and come out of the other side with policies that are more effective and more inclusive. Um, so that's, that's a highlight that um, I'm really excited to share. Oh, thank you. That is so great. I know that in my home state here, um, and I know some of them are on this webinar, they'll be the first to tell you that one of the good things that came out of the pandemic is we identified, we meaning governmental public health, identified new partners, new nonprofits that stepped up to the plate, um, you know, to help with all kinds of things um, that we didn't even know might be a partner for other things. So kudos to, to you for your work and so to the panelists, we've got five minutes left. So I want to go round robin, kind of like speed dating. And I want to ask you to focus on the number one, just one tip that um, is your advice for how we adapt our practices in public health to be more inclusive of diversity of thought, religious, cultural viewpoint, political viewpoint, et cetera, based on what we've discussed today when we think about governance um, in public health, governance and law. One quick tip, 30 seconds each, round robin, Dr. Montero, go. We have an amazing and fantastic historical opportunity right now to see how we can improve communication, messaging, and data. We need to modernize our governance systems for data, data sharing. We have great examples of how that can be improved, and we can share those. We are working with our partners in NATO and ASTO and others to identify and highlight those. We need to uh, update our models of the type of health departments that this country needs. Uh, we, we need more. Uh, sharing, uh, cross-jurisdictional sharing, and we need data for action at the level that actions are taking. That requires us to change the way that we look at it, that we share it, and that we engage with our political elected officials in looking at it and getting the communities to better understand it. Awesome, thank you. Elke? Great, thank you. I will just say ditto to what Jose said, but I will also say um, listen is kind of our, our number one um, initiative that we're taking, being better listeners to community voices. Uh, we are in making investments in some community-driven place-based um, health initiatives called Get Healthy Idaho across the state and looking at, it's similar to Rhode Island's health equity zones, but really listening to what community issues are and then how can we jointly um, help solve those but let the community voice drive what those solutions are and not make any presumptions that we know what they are. Um, and another key element of that is, you know, making sure that we, it's, it's okay for us to say we don't understand, we don't know, um, we need to not uh, kind of, I don't want to say fake, but I can't think of a, different, a better word than that right now, but we, you know, we want to make sure that if, if we don't know something, we say we don't know it and we uh, kind of operate through humility and ask what the community needs and just really listen, and I think would be my, my number one takeaway. 
Oh, wow, you're speaking my language, LT. Listen and be transparent, and I don't know, but I'll find it out. So, Claude, go. Thank you, Kate. Again, fantastic discussion. I would just say we must continue to invest in the power of the trusted source. So we've heard reference about empowerment models. We've heard reference about tapping into assets and community and ambassadors. But doing that, rather than speed dating, I would say that we must invest in the relationship building. So however we can do that so that we can tap into the trusted sources in community, I think it would bode well. It will force us to change and challenge the status quo. But at the end of the day, it's about making sure that we have a mechanism for amplifying the voice of community. So I would just say that, that we must continue to amplify the power of the trusted sources in community. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Scott. Yeah, Elkie stole my answer. I can't believe it, um, but I will expound <laughs> on that. It, it, the answer to me is listen, she's 100% right. And I, I do think Dr. Montero said something that I think is, is brilliant and it's that public health is political. And, and what is a little counterintuitive is that the folks on this call, with, except me, you're experts, you have the answers. So it is counterintuitive to then tell you to listen instead of talk because you know the answer to the question. However, the question that's being asked of you all is at times as important as the answer that comes back. And so listen is the word I would use. And if, if I could leave with one thought, it's this, and I hope this is empowering to everybody who has to fight this fight every day. The truth is inclusive. Don't ever doubt that or forget it because we seek the truth from you all and you all give it to us. Awesome, thank you, Scott. And Aisha? I think what I would leave folks with is to really emphasize that um, we have weathered, are weathering multiple disasters at the same time and that while disasters bring terrible hardship from marginalized communities, right? Whether we're talking about climate or economic or health, uh, disasters also offer what we can think of as these wet cement moments where systems and structures that previously seemed impervious to change actually become malleable um, and changeable. And so in this wet cement moment we find ourselves in today, we have maybe a once in a generation opportunity to reimagine what should properly be governed as public and what should properly be governed as private. Um, and we're seeing more and more that the, the basic necessities of life, the things we call the social determinants of health are caught um, in a very vigorous debate between whether they are public goods and the appropriate subject of public governance or whether they are private goods that should be um, settled by marketplace actors. And so I would argue that now is an incredible and critical opportunity to bring our health equity values, to bring our racial justice values to this conversation um, about what should be governed as public versus private um, and bring more of the social determinants of health, housing, clean air, good schools and jobs into the public realm so that they may appropriately be publicly governed. Awesome. Well, so we could talk about this forever and I'm, I've been sort of a little bit distracted watching the chat. Uh, rest assured for those of you who put comments in the chat, um, we'll get back to those as we go through the day. But right now, I just wanna thank our panelists. You guys did an awesome job. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think we learned a lot and we will move now to uh, back to Judy and then to our next panel. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Kay, for being such a great moderator and to all of our, our panelists. So you guys you guys were really terrific. Um, and so now um, we're, it's, going, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Karen Minyard, uh, Director of the Georgia Health Policy Center, and Jeff Levy, Professor of Health Policy and Management at George Washington University. Karen and Jeff will set the stage for discussion related to public health financing. And so I'm going to turn the podium uh, now over to Karen to, to get us started. 
Thank you, Judy. I'm really happy to be here and happy to be able to talk a little bit about how to be a money whisperer, approaches to innovative financing. And on the next slide, I'm going to show you <laughs> what we're going to be talking about today is the money. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the journey that we've taken over the last seven years to learn more about innovative financing and funding for population health. And we're gonna do a brief practice on building a mindset to see the money. This is important because all of the current reports, Public Health Forward, the Future of Public Health, Public Health 3.0, all focus on the importance of new sustainable and flexible funding for public health and blending and braiding funding and thinking about resource sharing between government agencies. So this little bit of information and this practice will help with that future of public health. The next slide, I wanted to say about the kind of the capstone of this work is the concept of innovation. And innovation occurs when effectively influencing the flow of funds in your community to drive impact. Financing innovations include the application, combination, and creation of financing tools and methods. So that means you might create something new, you might combine things that others have done, or you might um, think about how to apply something in a different setting than someone else has applied. On the next slide, over the last seven years, we've worked with very closely with a number of sites. The Bridging for Health sites began to study various financing innovations, working with CDFIs, impact investing, pay for success, new market tax credit, hospital community benefit, low income housing tax credits. They looked at all of these different kinds of inno innovations and they all settled on building local wellness funds as an umbrella for other financing mechanisms, a way to put resources together in the community and then think about how to use those to support the work that they wanted to do. The second group, the Locus, Local Wellness Fund cohort, all had some type, some version of a local wellness fund. The, it might've been a structure uh, where they guided resources or it might've been an actual fund. Two of these communities are gonna share their stories in the panel of possibilities. Now, one of the things that happened on the next slide when we were working with the first cohort, they said, yeah, yeah, we get it. Financing innovations, you've taught us about those. We understand the importance of stewardship strategy and equity, but we need something <clears throat> to help us get into action. And so we engaged a private sector partner that helped us design an innovation cycle where people in, this, in the community thought about what was happening. They defined and agreed on what they would wanna do. They ideated about the ideas, they created prototypes, and then they stress tested their prototypes. And in the end, um, they all looked at some type of a local wellness fund. So on the next slide, we'll see some of the components. It became clear to us that some of the important things to think about were what are the sources of where does the money come from? The second, what are the uses? How will the monies be used to support population health? And then the structure. This goes a little bit to our earlier conversation about governance, but a little bit about how we manage, administer, and provide stewardship over the funds. Also important in thinking about this is both the external environment, what's going on, and we're going to hear a little bit more about our current external environment as it relates to the federal funding from Jeff Levy in just a moment, 
and also the internal factors. What is happening in the community? And this is something that I would say is almost a theme from the previous session, and that is how can the community be involved in making decisions about how things happen? Now, on the next slide, we're gonna have a little bit of a practice. So this is your chance to begin uh, either ex expanding your practice of seeing the money in the system or uh, begin it if you haven't already done so. So what I'd like for you to do is review the image that is shown on the next slide. It represents a common phrase. When you know the phrase, the image represents, write it in the chat, but do not press send, await further instructions. So review the image, write down what it represents, but don't press send. So on the next slide, here is the image. What common phrase does this image represent? I'm going to give just a few seconds for you to write your answer in the chat. Somebody already wrote it. <laughs> OK, so write your answer in the chat. A lot of people are getting this. Now, I think I, I have done this in large audiences where no one got it right. In this, I'm looking at the chat. It looks like maybe at least 100 people have gotten sleeping on the job. So let's go to the next one. We're going to do the same thing again. Here is an image. Don't press send. Write in the chat what this image represents. OK, press send. Let's see. Help me watch. Has any, I haven't seen it yet. I'll give you a hint. It has to do with baseball. The Atlanta team won. There we go, World Series. <laughs> okay, all right. Now go to the next one. One, all those things about globalization and you know, those are, those are good too, but that wasn't what the image represented. Okay, so here's your last, oh no, you've given the answer. Uh, <laughs> this is one that um, I like because green relates to money. And you could see on the slide that it says mixed greens. So when you think about these word games, it causes your brain to work in just a little bit of a different way. And this is the way that you want your brain to work when you're thinking about seeing the money in the system, seeing beyond the obvious. We think about macro system level, seeing the money. And that would be um, like in one of the communities where the banker was a part of the collaborative and the banker stood up and said, I see the money in the system and I see the opportunity for traditional banking and for CDFIs and for loans and for grants and various different ways that we could structure the money. I see the image of it all. And that helped the people in the community to think more broadly beyond grants. The micro level um, would be an example where the local government had money left over for labor that was going to go back to the general fund. And the local collaborative said, well, could we use that money for community health workers? That's a labor promoting activity. And the local government said, yes, you can use the money in this way. So this is a very micro level uh, seeing the money in the system. Some people do this naturally. And some people are able to practice like we're doing today to learn this. When we were in the course of seeing this unfold across the United States, Chris Parker, who you'll hear from soon, coined the term money whisperers. 
These are the people either at the macro and or micro level who can see the money in the system and can think about new ways to put it together for good use. The next slide shows a couple of the, a few of the ingredients of what does it take to invest together? The right people, willingness to innovate, shared purpose, stewardship mindset, a system view, and an ability to see the money in the system. Right now we have an unprecedented amount of money in the system. And Jeff Levy is going to share with you a little bit about that. So good luck, good luck with your money whispering skills. Well, thank you, Karen. Um, and before we move to, to Jeff, uh, we're actually going to, to uh, have our second poll question. Uh, so we're gonna pause and take uh, a poll on finance issues to see where all, all of you are. Um, so which of the following funding mechanisms are you most familiar with? Again, choose one option. And if you have another idea uh, or other thoughts, choose uh, other at the bottom and go ahead and put your response into the chat. So we'll give you a moment to select your single answer. And again, if you don't like any of these, then go to other and put it into the chat. And we'll have the answers here. Just a moment. Okay, do we have a, a tally? Let's see where the, uh, so the most familiar, boy, again, they're, they're distributed, uh, all of the above. And then we've got community, the hospital community benefit and low income housing tax credits uh, seem to be the lead. The, um, there's a lot in the chat as well. So we'll be, we'll be uh, pulling all that together. Okay, so thank you for uh, your participation in the poll and your attention. And now we're gonna turn to uh, Jeff, uh, over to you. Thanks so much, Judy. And I will do a very rapid fire review of where things are moving in terms of new federal investments to rebuild public health. Um, with the goal of really trying to begin to think about the opportunities this brings, not just to respond to the pandemic, but also to rebuild public health in the way we've all been talking about. Next slide, please. So public health is used to performing a juggling act um, or walking and chewing gum at the same time. And we're right, you know, we're certainly at this intersection right now of needing to respond to the pandemic, but also thinking about how we rebuild governmental public health with foundational capabilities in mind. And still yet the third piece, which is recognizing that the pandemic has shown us that the underlying health and social factors that strengthen or weaken communities, make us more resilient or less resilient, really made a difference in terms of how the pandemic affected different communities and therefore also how we need to rebuild. All of this has to be done with an equity lens as we're thinking about empowering communities and building a stronger public health workforce that really reflects the communities that are served, similar to things that we've heard already today. Next slide, please. So I think we wanna start with this notion of public health as the chief health strategist for a community. And the chief health strategist isn't an individual, but it is actually the role of public health as bringing the community together to really think about what are the critical elements that need to be addressed to improve health and well-being in a community. That is, it always starts, of course, with a specific role for governmental public health, whether it's during a crisis or for building healthier communities. And we that's reflected, I think, in the foundational public health services framework, in particular, those foundational capabilities. But the pandemic has also reinforced our need to really mobilize 
all sectors, as we heard in the first panel, to appropriately and to respond appropriately and to support public health interventions. And we saw, even in the most narrow sense of responding to the pandemic, that without hospitals, without health centers, without community-based organizations, we wouldn't have reached the people we needed to reach, we wouldn't have been able to provide the services that we needed to reach, we wouldn't have reached all of the constituencies that were really important. Next slide, please. So, we've seen a lot of money pumped into um, the system. And so you can see here uh, just the, the magnitude of, of the investment here. And so this is really comparing things to different, and this is a, a, a slide that Karen Minyard developed at, at the Georgia Health Policy Center. The first dotted line going up and down is the, the initial tobacco settlement, which was a major investment in public health. The second one was the total investment during the New Deal. And the third one is the total investment in the Great Recession. So you can see with these various investments that are cumulative, um, that the federal government has made the context adjusted for inflation has been huge in terms of our investment in public health and related activities. Next slide, please. This is just a slide, and it's meant to be confusing, uh, of the investments in the American Rescue Plan Act. What's important to see here is that in thinking about how we respond to the pandemic, how we rebuild from the pandemic, the federal government and Congress has taken an all of government approach. And when we are thinking in our communities, we also have to think of an all of government, all of society approach. In particular, that first bucket of funding from the Department of Treasury is $350 billion in funding that is totally flexible for states and localities to make up for lost revenue or theoretically lost revenue that can be invested in innovative ways to really build, rebuild communities with an eye toward health and well-being. On the right side, you see a lot of the HHS-specific investments. Those also are huge, but it's really important to think about how all of these can be leveraged together. Next slide, please. And so the, the critical question for public health, of course, is always these are one-time investments and will they be sustained over time? And that's where we have to do this juggling act of addressing pandemic-specific needs, building the infrastructure, especially our workforce and data, but also thinking about how this flexible funding can address community social needs having a government a community-wide vision framing it in a larger context will really make a difference in whether we can convince policymakers we can spend this money well and we can therefore and we therefore should continue this investment over time next slide please and so this means thinking very differently about how we sometimes spend money public health can't and shouldn't go it alone Sometimes because public government agencies can't move it fast enough, sometimes because we can't hire people fast enough, but also because we need to be supporting other entities that can do this work and build the credibility. And so you see here a list of potential in what we call intermediaries, um, community-based organizations, foundations, who can others who can help with hiring, managing money, planning, convening community engagement, and building trust and implementing programs. Next slide, please. And so we've been developing this concept of funding navigators, people who, nav who play different roles sometimes, uh, sort of the money whisperers that Karen was talking about, who can help identify funding, can really d assess what, it, what are the, the community's needs, and find and match with the community's needs the funding that is needed. Next slide, please. And so, in this rapid fire <laughs> approach to all this money, the most important thing is that we need to be providing a coherent vision. How the community can be can rebuild with an equity and health and well-being framework, how governmental public health can strategically invest these funds to assure the foundational public health capabilities, and how all sectors in our community can be mobilized to support public health equity and well-being to build the rationale for sustained public health. So I hope that provides a framework for the rest of the discussion we're going to be doing. Um, and I will turn it back, I think, to Karen or Judy. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take over, Jeff. Thanks so much. Uh, that, that really is terrific uh, information for all of us as we uh, move, move forward in, in our discussions. 
So we're now going to move uh, to another quick poll, actually, and uh, engage the audience once again. Um, how ready are you to help others use the unprecedented federal funding that is now available through the American Rescue Plan Act and other sources? On the list here, there are your answers. How ready are you to help others? Okay, so we should have answers. Uh, we'll see our collective answers here in a moment. And here we go. And uh, the majority of folks uh, are thinking about it. Uh, so, uh, however, 20% don't even have uh, have this on, on your radar yet. So uh, hopefully today's uh, summit will, uh, will move you uh, along, the, uh, along this and uh, we'll get folks ready to begin or already doing it, 18% uh, there. Okay, so next um, we're gonna move to our financing panel of possibilities. Um, I'd like to welcome our moderator, Chris Parker of the Georgia Health Policy Center to moderate uh, our next panel. So uh, Chris, take it away. Thank you so much, um, Judy, I appreciate that. I also appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this discussion. It's been so rich. Um, at this time, I, I've been writing notes. Um, I think it's happening at a really great time where public health has been, for the most part, under the microscope given um, the pandemic that we've been engaged in for the last two years. I also want to be um, cognizant and thankful to my colleagues, Karen and Jeff, for setting this panel up. Um, today, we have four panelists who will each share their own stories and examples of how to explore some of these possibilities. They'll help us to unpack and immerse ourselves in what might be possible. I'm gonna quickly introduce them. You should have access to their full bios in the material that's associated with this event. Rita Carrion is the Vice President of Unidos US and she'll be sharing her perspective and some of the work that um, she's been involved with. Kimberly Kutcher, from the Toledo Local Initiative Support Corporation, otherwise known as LISC, and she's the executive director there. Erminia Frias, um, councilwoman, the Pasqua Yaki Tribal Council, and Seamus McCarty from the Yamhill Community Care Organization. Seamus is in Oregon, in Yamhill County, and Erminia is in um, Arizona. So, here are the objectives for today's conversation. And everyone's aware of them who will be talking. We wanna be able to appreciate this um, money that's everywhere coming from the feds and explore the mechanisms that will allow us to kind of have access to those funds. And Jeff spoke um, about that. To understand what it means to apply a financing mindset to the kind of public health leaders um, tool bag. How, how to have that mindset ready and handy. And then to highlight the insights from local organizations that have used innovative approaches to get their public health work funded. So that's kind of our starting point. And I'm gonna invite each of the panelists to maybe spend a few minutes just sharing their own stories. I'd like for you to be able to um, talk about the mindset of seeing the money in the system um, how you've been thinking about this kind of current unprecedented federal funding and the methods that you are currently using to support financing of population health in your neck of the world. Um, we're gonna see this as like tapas, you know, a little bit of food that we're gonna build on and have a conversation. And as you're listening to our panelists, I'm gonna ask you um, to consider what is exciting to you as you're hearing from them and maybe what curiosities you have or remain 
as they go through their stories. I'm going to start out with Rita. Rita, how are you doing? Good. How are you? It's great to be here. To have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about how your organization is thinking about this unprecedented um, level of federal funding and how you are organizing to take advantage of the opportunity that is before? So first of all, I just want to thank um, you know, Judy and, and Karen and Jeff and, and, and you, Chris, for, for all your leadership. Uh, it's been, I've been listening to the chats or reading the chats and it's been very exciting to see. Um, so you know, we represent the nation's largest Latino civil rights and advocacy organization. Um, and at Unidos US, our mission is really to build a stronger America um, by creating equitable and just opportunities for Latinos. So it is very unprecedented. Um, this federal funding opportunity, not only to provide an opportunity to invest in the current and address the current pandemic and economic crisis, but also to reimagine a more equitable approach to you know, help strengthen our systems, our practices, and, and really centering where our communities can benefit and access critical resources. And so for us, you know, as, you know, a, a national nonprofit organization, there is, you know, continued heightened demand from, you know, community-based organizations, including the nearly 300 community-based organizations that are part of our affiliate network, um, and the need to build capacity, to expand, to strengthen, um, and deliver social services, you know, to the Latino community. So one of the things that we started thinking about, and a lot of it was due to, you know, Jeff and Karen's leadership and, and really thinking about it with other partners, is how do, how do we organize ourselves? You know, so one of the things that we did internally, and this is behind the scenes, right, is to establish an internal federal affairs working group. Um, and this is to expand our outreach and engagement with the federal government. Um, these internal shifts in strategy and priorities have both intensified and diversified our involvement across all the issues that we are currently addressing as a civil rights organization and that impact the social determinants of health. So not only are we working on health, but we're working on housing, we're working on education, immigration, workforce development, and economic empowerment. And as you know, many of our communities of color you know, have all been impacted in a number of different ways across these issues. So having a cross-component working group aims to prioritize, to coordinate, to manage our institution-wide efforts, as well as enhance our affiliate networks engagement with government, not only at the state level, but also at the federal level. Um, and this, you know, we're hoping that will eventually increase access to federal funding in communities that advances, you know, systems change. I think one effort that we have, you know, even as the administration changed, was for us to even work with 11, you know, national Latino organizations to try to even diversify the government and the administration, right? It was called our Proyecto 20, um, which was really to try to get more candidates, you know, identify and vet candidates into the administration and diversity and leadership matters in so many ways for us to be able to ensure that there are um, you know, uh, leaders in government that are thinking about communities of color. Um, and that's a critical thing. And I think the results that you're seeing you know, is that we've achieved collectively is, is having at least four Latino candidates, um, you know, Latinos in the cabinet level positions. It's just one example. But I think we're looking forward to, to doing more um, and, and happy to talk about how we use some of the funds that we're supporting. Thank you so much, Rita. Um, hearing you speak, the two things I'm kind of taking away. Um, one is the, this idea of thinking of health, not just from the standpoint of health and health care, but thinking through the determinants. So as you're positioning yourself, maybe thinking about who else needs to be at the table in this conversation. You mentioned a kind of focused way of thinking um, by bringing together a, a work group, a small group who's focused on looking at where the money is and having these communications. So you're setting yourself up by um, organizing and organizing internally to learn and then organizing to act. And so I appreciate that. We're gonna come back to that, but I wanna give um, Kim Kutcher uh, an opportunity to uh, maybe say a little bit about the fund there in Toledo, Ohio. I know it's a fascinating, in my mind at least, way in terms of thinking about how you might bring some good to the community that way. And so Kim, I'm gonna invite you to um, come on screen and say a little bit about the sources, the uses of uh, the fund there in Toledo, Ohio. And if public health is involved, if you could say a little bit about 
what that looks like or what you might hope for that to look like. Sure, and Chris, I, oh, the host, um, I'm getting a message that the host has stopped me, so I can't um, turn on my camera. <laughs> oh, there's a lovely picture there. So, so far we're, we, we're good. Um, I, I'll, I'll see if we can, uh, during the time you're speaking, get your- Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry, I apologize Hello. about that. Go ahead. So thank, hi, thank you, Chris and IPH and partners. It's a, I was listening to some of the conversations earlier. It's very encouraging to think about how close um, and how our relationship with health and community development has changed in particular um, in Toledo in 2018, uh, LISC in the Toledo office and with the national organization established a partnership with ProMedica, um, our health system here regionally, um, it really focused on driving uh, changes in neighborhood conditions in a number of different ways. And so we established our health impact fund, which was $25 million, $15 million from LISC and $10 million um, from ProMedica to provide low cost financing to support housing, small business, and a number of other community type facilities and projects. And all of the places in which we were working um, to drive a pipeline of projects were really uh, funneled through collaborative partnerships where public health um, with that county health department and hospital council and other health systems were sort of at the table working with neighborhood residents and businesses to support and adopt neighborhood-based plans that really were key and instrumental in driving the pipeline of opportunities that the fund has considered so far. The partnership um, has created uh, you know, opportunities to empower people by working through communities and resident leadership to transform place and support entrepreneurship through small business, particularly supporting BIPOC-owned uh, businesses, women, and underserved communities for the whole purpose of driving innovation through our approach. Early on, we recognized that communities, including Toledo, had healthcare institutions and public health at the table, but we were really interested in supporting community initiatives that would be a collaborative type of relationship. So that way, historic relationships where phil uh, philanthropy would be at the table to invest in particular initiatives um, are important, but the fund really worked to create those relationships that are multi-sector and begin to access a number of different financing tools, including the Health Impact Fund, to create uh, solutions that would allow for many more um, projects, whether it's affordable housing or small business, to be supported to change the conditions in the neighborhoods that we were working in. We felt that our approach was different because we were coming together to utilize our respective expertise. LISC as a CDFI, ProMedica as a health institution, and positioning our leadership allowed for us to work with the community and support strategies that were already underway and driven at a neighborhood level. Um, that you know, community level plans that I had referenced were really um, representative of the neighborhoods in which we were working in and really supported uh, resident leadership being at the table, driving solutions, working with all of us as partners um, to come up with innovative approaches to using our resources. We, in addition to the financing um, that we provided through the fund, we developed an innovative tool um, that helped us as an organization scan for health determinants and begin to work with borrowers to connect the types of ways that they were approaching projects through a health lens. So whether that was brownfield remediation or the types of materials they were using in projects or how they were engaging with community or engaging other partners was really key um, to that assessment tool that we developed and build capacity with partners that were receiving funds and financing from our health impact fund and elevated health 
um, beyond just the partners that were at the table, but with the borrowers that we were working with. So we're screening for environmental, social, and health impacts as a way to measure um, or prioritize our investments. To date, we've invested $6 million to remediate um, contamination in BIPOC and LMI neighborhoods, activating blighted industrial buildings uh, by creating almost 40 units of affordable housing and 10,000 square feet of commercial space for five MBE WBE businesses. This investment has leveraged an additional $4 million of funding, which we feel is very important, um, not just the additional resources to make these projects possible, but a teaching and supporting the capacity building of partners with leveraging the capital stack, layering on these resources and braiding um, the compliance and regulations that many of these other funding sources may have. Uh, we felt that leadership all along and everyone that's spoke today that I've listened to so far has really talked about how leadership is really foundational to the work that we're all uh, seeking to uh, move towards and that relationships are also um, so important to carrying out this work. And I think that our partnership between LISC and ProMedica has really established that shared vision with community to address the health and wealth disparities that exist in our community. We are working together to leverage each other's organizational expertise, uh, our resources and partnerships to develop solutions that are innovative, but solutions that mirror the magnitude of the problem. I think some key takeaways, um, and I know early um, this morning, folks were talking about you know, being comfortable with conflict and how is it that you sort of approach problems, understanding each organization's culture and be comfortable with sort of working through and sifting through some of the problems and challenges that come up, I think is very key. I think that the relationship that we have had um, with the partners um, in Toledo, including ProMedica, all seek to create better conditions working with the community that address health and wealth disparities, but that that um, takes time to work through those relationships, work through those challenges. And I think that, you know, that conflict resolution and, and relationship building is key and something that needs to be fostered and maintained throughout these long-term partnerships. I think the engagement uh, with the community and working with neighborhood leaders at a very grassroots level has been critical um, and really cannot be um, underinvested in uh, developing and supporting resident and community leaders so that they can be at the table and part of the process are things that we certainly have valued through our relationship and the work that we're investing in and things that we should be thinking of as we all embark on our work across the country. I so appreciate that, Kim. I appreciate um, a couple of things there. The fact that you um, spoke to the, the messiness of um, show me the money and that there are multiple stakeholders. And even though um, so CDF, CDFI and the health system um, getting things kicked off, the voice of the community, the input from the, the health departments, all very important in understanding um, and making it happen. And so how to do that, I'm really happy that you called out the, the messiness of it. And that you also mentioned that the, the fund itself um, provides for awards, but also provides for financing. So there's a way in which the model is kind of replenishing itself. I appreciate all of that. Thank you. And I am going to come back with a few other questions, but at this point in time, I want to move us on to have a listen to Erminia. And Erminia, could you say a little bit about um, how the Pasco Yaki tribe has used innovative resources in general, and specifically the unprecedented federal funding that has been available to support tribal health? Welcome. Thank you, Yosin Chinabu. I, I sure will. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with everyone here today. 
I'd like to talk a little bit about um, our experience in the beginning with the pandemic and how we used our, how we addressed it and, and what we did that I feel was unique. And I think probably a lot of uh, tribal nations throughout the country did too. And so one of the things that we did in the very beginning when we experienced the pandemic um, with the closures was how a lot of different entities and governments did was, you know, close down congregate services. And so for us at the Pascua Yaqui tribe, when we were, when we closed down our congregate services, the first thing that we did was think about our elders. And so our congregate services with our elders, we closed down the, our, our elders and our Head Start. And at that time, it was in the middle of our ceremonial time. So it was very important for us to think of how the loss of our connection with our ceremony and also food security. So those two things came into mind were how are people gonna stay connected because now we are in the middle of a pandemic and also in the middle of ceremony and food security, because a lot of times that is where our elders go and get their food. And that is also where our little ones get their meals too, right? It's the Head Start program. And then it expanded to our kids in school. A lot of our kids go to the public school system. So not only did we close down our own um, congregate services, but also the public school system closed down. So these kids were now going to their homes and going to school virtually. So that was also that came into mind because that was for a lot of these kids where they got their meal, they got their breakfast there and they got their lunch there. So that came into mind was the, these kids, where are they gonna get their meals and do they have the resources for them to learn? Do they have the technology? Do they have the space? Do they have everything to accommodate for them to learn? So those were the types of things that came into mind as far as we are in the middle of a pandemic and we have kids at home, we have elders at home, we, are, we don't have ceremony and everything else is going on. So one of the first things that we did when we called a meeting with our tribal directors and everyone was let's focus on food security, let's focus on connectedness, how do we keep our tribal citizens connected? How do we ensure that they are getting the resources that they need? How do we make sure that our elders that normally come in that we don't know if they have a caretaker or not? We don't know if they have access to, what if they do get the virus and they're home alone? All of these different things, how do we get meals to these kids? So we said, one of the first things that we said were, we are going to code everything that we do COVID-19 that's related to COVID-19. It was one of the first things we said, if, it, if you're doing anything related to COVID-19, code it. And we didn't know if we were gonna get any CARES Act, didn't exist at that time. We didn't know, but we knew that something was gonna come about because everyone was experiencing the same thing. Said so there is gonna, you know, we, everybody's experiencing this, there's gonna be money available, something's gonna happen, but let's just be prepared. So let's code everything that we're doing right now, let's prepare. And so everything that we were doing, we were, we were having all of our, our finance team, every, all of our accountants, making sure that everything was logged, all of the work that we were doing around the pandemic, somebody was logging it. And we also told our team to focus on serving focus on taking care of our community and, and have the accountants and everyone else who's responsible for the coding and the details and all that stuff, let them worry about who's going to pay for what. Don't worry about all these silos and that's not my program. I don't belong. I'm not supposed to be doing that. I'm not supposed to be doing this. Let's just focus on taking care of our community. Let's just focus on that for now so that we make sure that our elders are getting fed and we can use whatever we need to use to transport meals. Let's not worry about 
you know, that it's getting paid through this or that. We'll focus on that later. So we really focused on people. Yeah. And so that's, that's really what we did in the very beginning and making sure that we had all of the resources that we needed through all of the, the you know, education, um, the funding that we were getting through Head Start, the funding and, and ensuring that these kids are covered through Head Start funding. These kids are covered through um, state funding. These kids are covered through our tribal general fund. These kids are covered through our elder services. These kids, you know, will cover this through this, you know, and everything, our finance was taking care of that. And we're going to have to cover this in another way. But everybody was, we were not turning people away. Yeah. We were just making sure everybody was taken care of. And then, you know, when we finally were able to get CARES Act, that was great because we were able to continue our services. And, you know, it was, it was, um, it was really just focusing on what it is that, that we needed to do and then just expanding on also realizing the gaps in our services and also things that we actually wanted to do, but we weren't able to do. And so expanding some of the things like broadband and, and um, expanding services to elders that we didn't get to see, but now we knew there were elders out there that we weren't able to serve and connecting with our enrollment services because we knew they were there and saying, yeah, now we can go see them because some of our employees that aren't doing their typical job because we're now even closed in our, in our area, our, even our casino closed down. So those employees were now doing a different role. And those employees that were typically working in their kitchen, now we're working in our kitchen. So, so if, if I may just interject sure. here quickly, I mean, so it feels like part of your approach, which is interesting here, was not necessarily to try and go chasing the dollars, but to understand almost from a human standpoint, root cause. You talked about social connection. You talked about food. Um, understanding your gaps, understanding your needs, and, and in an effort to ensure that you had what you need to supply and service the community, that then when the money came, you were already ready to kind of rock and roll right? because you had done all of that research. Right. I appreciate that. And we're going to come back to that. I want to give sure. Seamus an opportunity to share his story. Um, I know you have a local wellness fund um, established, and there's probably a little bit more to that story. Um, Seamus. So can you go ahead and tell us a little bit about um, how you got things started, sources, the way in which the funding is structured, say a little bit so that we can understand from the standpoint of what's possible, what you've done to date. Great. Thanks, Chris. And good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending upon where you are. Seamus McCarthy, I'm the CEO for Yamhill Community Care. Uh, Yamhill Community Care is a coordinated care organization in Oregon. We are the entities that contract with the state to provide Medicaid services to a particular geographical area. Uh, there are 15 uh, of us in the state. Uh, and our community came together when this law went into place in 2011, 2012. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and we decided we would build our own uh, CCO. And one of the things that was really important to the community was upstream investments uh, in uh, social determinants of health. And so we started working with, uh, with um, George Health Policy Center about seven years ago in innovations and in financing that have long-term population health uh, impact. Uh, and over the years, what we landed on, as Karen was uh, hinting at earlier, is a wellness fund. Uh, and, um, and so the way we started funding the wellness fund um, was the CCO gets reimbursed. Uh, actually, it's a bonus type of system uh, based on health metrics that we meet. Uh, and so we qualified for 100% of our payouts, uh, uh, our payouts every year because of meeting uh, good health outcomes. And so we took 10% and those have ranged anywhere. I mean, well, I think the most recent was, was, was about $7.2 million dollars. And so what we've done is we've taken 10% off of the top of those dollars and put into our community prevention and wellness fund. Um, the other way that we've, uh, that we've built funding for uh, the wellness fund uh, is through partnerships with, uh, with public health uh, uh, and with our community, uh, our, uh, our commissioners in our county. 
Uh, one way is that public health contributes a certain percentage of the value of the contract that they have with us for providing behavioral health services back into the wellness fund. Uh, the commissioners also um, supported the wellness fund uh, by using uh, Medicare tax dollars that they received from, uh, from the state. We also have begun um, working with our contracted uh, entities, such as our dental care organization, our non-emergent medical transportation organization, uh, and our major third-party administrator, um, uh, and working uh, 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 financing of the CPW into their contracts by, by, by similar to what we're doing with HHS, uh, uh, getting a certain percentage of the value of our contract um, uh, donated to uh, the wellness fund. Uh, and so those are some of the financing ways um, that we, that, that we uh, have used uh, to date. Um, some of the things that we're investing here in our community, um, you know, the CPW fund is used to make these upstream investments um, in, in long-term population health efforts uh, in the community. And it supports a range of programs for children and families, you know, to, um, to prevent future problems and programs uh, to bolster well-being and success in the long term. So some of the things that we've been investing in over time uh, is, uh, uh, is in, in prenatal, uh, preconception and prenatal uh, postpartum uh, investments, such as evidence-based um, universal home visiting programs. Uh, and there are you know, many programs uh, that we've invested in each of these categories I'm gonna mention, but um, I'm not gonna mention them all be just be due to time today. But we're also doing a lot of investments in early childhood, infants through elementary. So for instance, we're investing in six of our seven school districts with the PACS Good Behavior Game. Um, th that's a school-based pro-social initiative. Um, all families um, have, you know, are offered universal um, home visiting. Um, we also um, support through social emotional training, uh, and we've been investing in pre-kindergarten uh, education as well. For middle school and high school, um, you know, we, we uh, do a lot of suicide uh, prevention efforts, uh, working on, uh, uh, on drug and alcohol issues. Uh, and also social emotional learning. Uh, and then of course, we, we're, uh, we're looking at the entire lifespan, uh, not, just, uh, not just early life. Um, and, uh, um, and we've invested in things like the Wellbeing Council that we have here, the Family Wellbeing Council uh, that we have here uh, in Yadmill County. Now, one of the things that we've realized is, you know, we're a Medicaid organization and we know that, you know, I, there are investments that we've made over the years, but we're not going to fund all of the social uh, determinants of health investments that are needed in our community uh, by Medicaid margin alone. Uh, there's just not enough margin to do that. And the need in the community is large and I'm sure it's large in every community. Uh, and so uh, what we've done is we've asked the board uh, of um, the board of directors of Yam Health Community Care uh, to support dedicated FTE for taking our community prevention and wellness fund uh, to the next level. And so in this year in our budget, we have worked in a certain amount of admin support in addition to the 10% of our metrics dollars that we get. And this is to fund, you know, equivalent of about four FTE in order to support this fund. And one of the major objectives uh, of this fund is, um, or of this, this effort is to hire a development director, um, eventually an executive director, but we're starting with the wellness fund development director in order to set us on a course of what, um, of what Karen would call um, money whispering. Uh, and, uh, and so that is, you know, we're doing that now. We actually have that position uh, posted. Um, I'll post the link to our website in there in case there's anybody here that's really interested. I know it's a shameful, uh, a shameful plug here, but, um, you know, we're really excited about it and we'd love to have some folks, uh, folks on board who are excited about it as well. One piece of, you know, advice that I think I would give, I think that was one thing is, um, is, you know, pick your project before you try to pick your, um, your strategy. You know, get a project that your entire community to get, can get behind and get ownership, have ownership in. If you don't have ownership from the broad community when developing a community prevention and wellness fund, it's gonna be really hard to get off the ground. But if we pick a project that people can get excited about and really get uh, behind, um, it makes it a lot easier to get off the ground and then you pick your financing innovation from there. That, it took us a couple of years to learn that lesson, 
uh, and, uh, and it was a painful one. But with the help of uh, George Health Policy Center and Robert Wood Johnson, uh, we were able to, uh, 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 to understand that and to pick our wellness fund. Chris, I know I'm out of time here, so I'm going to stop for you. I appreciate that. But what you did was you set up the final question very well, um, and you've already answered it. Um, what one piece of advice would you give to folks? And I've been paying attention to um, what people are reporting as their takeaways. Uh, but I'll ask the rest of the panelists, just before we wrap up, if you could say only one, one piece of advice that you would give to the thousands of folks who are listening to you now, given your experience, what would that be? So I heard Shema say, pick it and then get the financing. Um, let me ask Rita, what, what piece of advice would you give to everyone? Well, I'm going to limit to a little bit more than, than, than one piece of advice. I think having an equitable lens consists of really being intentional flexible and being an ally for diverse organizations um, that have experience in working with marginalized communities. I think that's in, super important to involve community leaders in the process as you set up and seek funding yes. opportunities, provide support for fiscal administrative services, and establish continuous and transparent communication. I think that's super important. I think one of the challenges that we saw was also, you know, this lack of access to state and federal funding to increase the familiarity of of fiscal management and administrative processes, um, and even improving the capacity of data collection and reporting back to federal agencies. I think that's a critical element here that we're not talking about, is, is increasing the capacity of our CDOs um, that historically have not had access to federal funding in the past. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's, it's significant. Um, I think we have an opportunity for us to really focus on that equity lens. You know, we, we, we have provided about, you know, $14 million to our affiliate network. Um, you know, we have a CDC funded initiative on a vaccine program with 30 affiliates, including community health centers, where they increased 440 public and private partnerships. They established 460 new vaccine sites and, wow. and then they vaccinated over 114 individuals. So, you know, I think the results that you're seeing with Latinos having more access to vaccines and getting that uptake on the vaccines had a lot to do with on the ground efforts. And if you're not thinking about the communities and the community leaders that are part of that effort, I think it's super important for us to really um, you know, focus on that equitable lens. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I understand you said it's a little bit more than one, but I think it was very rich. It's a very rich one. Um, Herminia, can you say a little bit and, that, and I'll say to both yourself and Kim, we have probably about a minute each to make that one piece of advice happen. So if you go ahead and share what advice you provide to folks given your experience. I think uh, it would just be, you know, there's an opportunity to be creative. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yep. I, I think that's it. There's so many ways to be creative and there are so many people that you can have around the table that will allow that creativity. And so just do it. Yes. Be creative about how you can do things for your community and you will see that creativity expand. So use that creativity to leverage what you can do. And that's what it's all about. Leverage your financing opportunities. Yep. And that will be able to do more with less. I like that. In fact, I love that. Kim, Thank you. your thought? I think connecting the financial resources to community priorities is so important. The community has been working at these initiative and leading important work, asking for you know, leadership and other partners to come to the table. And so I think acknowledging that the work is already underway and bringing other partners and financial resources to support those priorities is very important. And def, you know, I think through that, defining the roles that each partner will play in managing and nurturing those relationships in and among the partners is extremely important to foster a long-term relationship um, that's gonna be necessary to support this work over a long-term period. Thanks. I think all very sage pieces of advice to those of us who are listening. It was interesting to me um, when, I was reviewing the comments that folks had made. There was a sense that, you know, maybe you don't chase the money. 
maybe what you do is you you set things up in a way that the money will find you, which goes a little bit against some of what you've been hearing about, you know, get an intermediary, intermediary, intermediary and making it happen. Um, but it's not too dissimilar in my mind from what happens like with diabetes, where there's sugar, sugar everywhere, but the cell doesn't have what it needs to, to take the best use of it. And so you need some support in making that happen. And so as we leave this session, um, I think we have an opportunity to think about um, how you know, we have that moral imperative as public health and you know, with the, the kind of pragmatic, we know what to do. How do we then layer on this mindset that is the business and the money, um, not, not that it is more important than, but thinking about who we are, and the people we serve, the needs that the community has, and how to ensure that the dollars that are now available get into the system of our needs and are maintained beyond the period that is COVID. And I think as we go through the rest of our conversations today and beyond, you'll have really good opportunity um, to start thinking about how to innovate together in this world that is public health. I wanna thank the panelists for your participation and for your wisdom um, this morning, this afternoon, and look forward to other times of engaging, hopefully in the very near future in person. This is all really cool, but there's nothing better than us sitting together when it's safe to do so. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you to those who listened and participated. And I'll turn things back over to Judy, who will uh, move us on to the next session. Thanks again. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that was a very thought prov provoking uh, discussion and a great, uh, great panel. So uh, we also wanna encourage everybody to keep uh, all the discussions going in the chat. Uh, it's really great to see all of your comments uh, coming from everyone participating today. Um, so next, we're going to move to our third panel, Public Health and the Law. Our moderator for this panel is uh, Donna Levin. Donna is the National Director of the Network for Public Health Law. And before we hear from our panelists, uh, we're going to take a poll on public health law. So our fourth uh, poll question. So here's your question. Uh, which one of the following would you prioritize to make public health law more effective and equitable? Again, you get one option uh, in your multiple choice here uh, with the uh, option of entering other and putting uh, your thoughts into the, uh, into the chat. Again, don't be shy about posting new ideas in the chat. Uh, and also post resources. I've seen throughout the day uh, some fantastic resources that people are, are posting uh, throughout the conversation. So again, we've got the Jeopardy music uh, playing in our heads as we uh, wait for the uh, poll question to be answered. This is a prioritize, a prioritizing question. And some great, uh, yeah, great suggestions coming in the chat, I can see. Including, I think, folks that would like to have an option of all of the above, so. Mm -hmm. All right, we ready for uh, the answers? Let's see how our poll came out. Um, and again, distributed over everything, so all of the above probably would have been a popular answer. Uh, but we've got 29% uh, uh, addressing structural racism to advance health equity, then evaluating the impact of laws on public health uh, and health. Uh, can't read the, the full question there. Um, or answer and engaging communities in public health policy development. So very good. Uh, thank you. And again, uh, as we've said, we we're taking all of the information throughout uh, today's summit and things will be packaged and uh, posted on the website uh, over time as we uh, pull everything together. Um, so uh, at this point, uh,
Donna, I think I turn it over to you, uh, your panel. You're on. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Judy. It's great to be here today. Uh, we've got a really impressive panel on public health and the law. You can find their full bios online. And this afternoon, I am joined by Dr. Axides Barbeau from the JPB Foundation, Stacy Bowen from the National Indian Health Board, Scott Burris from Temple University, and Sarah DeGia from Change Lab Solutions. And we wanna talk now about the objectives for this panel. One, to create a better understanding of the role that law plays in public health and how it will strengthen public health governance. Two, to identify potential solutions and possibilities for better incorporating law into public health at the local and state levels. And three, how to strengthen awareness of how public health law practice and frameworks can advance equity. So in this plenary, we are really focusing on the role of law, which is integral to governance and the practice of public health and can help us achieve the goals discussed during the governance plenary. So I am gonna start us off by asking Scott, what's the law have to do with public health? Can you tell us about the five essential public health law services framework and the role of law in public health and how it is related to strengthening governance, public health and public health equity? All in about six minutes, Scott, thanks. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's really exciting. I'm, I can do it because I'm so excited to be part of this event and to have heard all the brilliant speakers already. So I think I'm, I may be part of the, that, that family talk part that Judy talked about. Um, I may have, I have some critical things to say. And essentially, I want to speak to the future of public health via our recent past. We could not have had a stronger exhibition of the centrality of law in public health than COVID-19. But COVID-19 also demonstrated that the impact of law lies not so much on what is written in the books, but what is actually implemented on the streets. And implementation was largely the problem with law during COVID, and that goes directly to the degree to which public health decision makers and line staff and everybody in between understands how law actually influences behavior and environments or, or don't understand it. That's why we public health lawyers see improving the understanding of public health law and the utilization of public health law as two sides of the same coin. As part of our work to improve the use of law in public health over the last decade, a partnership of public health lawyers developed a model of five essential public health law services. This framework defines five core legal competencies that virtually everyone in public health needs, and along the way also conveys two big ideas about law and public health. Now, the five essential services or the competency areas are designing policy and legal interventions, putting them into actual legal form that will survive um, the legislative and judicial process, advocating for them, implementing them, and ultimately evaluating them to find out what works. Now, think about that. Most of that work is done by people who are not lawyers. It's legal work because it's about law, the design and use and evaluation of law, but lawyers don't come up with smoking bans or vaccine policies. We don't make the decisive political judgments in the system. We don't lead the advocacy and public education work. We don't distribute masks or inspect restaurants. And we don't do the scientific work of documenting effects and side effects. Yet all these steps and the skills to do them are crucial to making law do what we want it to do in public health. So the first big idea from this framework is that most people in public health, regardless of their training or their original discipline, are actually doing legal work as part of their job. It's not just lawyers. It's not just learning key concepts. Lawyers can't do this alone. I don't have to tell you that public health leaders and staff get virtually no robust professional training in how to do their legal work properly. As COVID has shown, for example, few public health decision makers have a good grip on why people obey the law and how to design and implement regulations to optimize compliance. I have to say within the family that the repeated series of elementary design and implementation mistakes during COVID was incredibly painful for us to watch. 
The second big idea is that using law for public health is a process in which all those elements from policy design on one side to evaluation and scale up and diffusion on the other have to be well integrated for law to work at its best. Keep in mind that even in emergencies, public health has the initial impetus, the first chance to define responsive measures. Through all of what happens next, we will never have had more control over the, over the whole process and over the outcome than that stage at which we are figuring out the initial um, policy ideas. And therefore we have the greatest stake um, of anybody in the system of getting those initial decisions right. If people who design policies are not thinking about legal issues, they may not be ready with good evidence and strong rationales when their policies are challenged in court. If they're not thinking about politics, they may design a legal intervention that can't be passed or that is crippled by widespread resistance and non-compliance. If they are not thinking about implementation during the design, drafting, and advocacy stages, they may fail to get the specific powers or the appropriation they need to actually implement the law effectively. And if finally, we don't treat legal interventions like any other public health intervention and properly evaluate them in a timely way, we never know if what we did worked or in fact, whether what we did is actually causing harm. This is particularly important if we care about equity because we know that so many neutral laws on the books on paper do not operate neutrally. So as with the big idea that law is an integral part of most everyone's public health work, the idea that law requires the deployment of strategic thinking and a wide range of skills makes clear that we need a drastic improvement in the nature and extent of public health law training and competency if we are to avoid implementation disasters in the future. The science we need to effectively use law in public health is not just epi, but social psychology, legal sociology, political science, engineering, economics, and so on. All these disciplines inform us as to how we get people to do what we want and how we change structures so that they're healthier in their, in their incentives. What we clearly saw in COVID was not a problem with law in the books, with the powers available in theory, but in how hard they were to use effectively. We use the five essential public health services to take law more seriously in public health, not just as rules, but as a set of skills and tasks for every public health player. There is so much in politics and society and the economy that makes our work hard and that we really can't change, but those cannot be explanations for failure. They're the conditions we're paid to deal with. Dealing with these barriers under conditions of uncertainty puts a premium on good judgment which depends in turn on our storehouse of competencies and our mental and professional openness to useful ideas. We urge public health to build lawyers and long-term thinking and education about law and human behavior far more deeply into the professional model. Consider it vaccination against future implementation failure. It might cause a little initial discomfort when you first get the shot, but it will provide a lifetime of protection against unforced errors and missed opportunities. Thanks, Donna. Back to you. Great. Well, Scott, that's a great foundation. And now we go over to Dr. Barbeau and ask from your perspective in the field as a public health agency leader, what did you learn about the role of law during the pandemic? And can you share an example or practice that illustrates the effective use of law? So thank you, Donna, it's a pleasure to be with you all. And I'm really glad that I'm following Scott because I feel like I'm at the right table at the family meeting. Um, <laughs> so what I learned about the role of law during a pandemic is that there are tactical differences between having the authority under law to act, acting on the authority one has under law and understanding the equity implications of enforcing the requirements that one puts into play under the laws that are available to us. And so one of the most critical things I've learned in my years of public health leadership is the importance of knowing and understanding the authority of your office before you need to use it. So not only do we need to be intimately familiar with the laws that help us carry out the everyday public health responsibilities entrusted to health departments, but we need to be especially familiar with those that are critical in emergencies. So in general, public health has a fairly robust regular, regulatory toolbox at our disposal. But how well we calibrate those tools 
during public health emergencies to balance civil liberties and civic accountability affects the public's trust in government, faith in medical advice, and belief in science. And so as such, good public health practice is defined by taking measured data-driven approaches that are often phased in because our legal powers to limit individual freedom are considerable, and we can't take those responsibilities lightly. And how quickly those phases are implemented depends on the nature of the public health emergency. So for example, during the last measles outbreak in New York City, our phased approach meant waiting a couple of weeks to see the outputs of measures like closing clusters of schools before increasing the intensity of interventions. Whereas in COVID, especially during the first wave, things needed to happen much more quickly and on a much larger scale. So in New York City, during the first wave, we, the city, state, and federal government, had all the laws that gave us authority to respond effectively and holistically to the COVID threat. However, the fact that authorization to trigger those laws rested at different levels of government made it jarringly apparent how quickly things could spiral into the challenges we found ourselves in. So for example, early invoking of the Def Defense Production Act at the federal level would have been critical to meeting PPE and ventilator needs during that first wave. And so one of the most painful things I learned about the law during a pandemic is that there's quote unquote, the not doing anything, which has its own kind of bad associated with it, but that there's also the delay in taking action, which can be just as bad. So for example, when community transmission was evident here in New York City, timely closing of schools and implementing shelter in place orders, legal authority, which rested with the city and state's highest elected leaders respectively, would have undoubtedly helped prevent countless infections, hospitalizations, and death. Lastly, just as importantly as having the authority and acting on the authority is the degree to which equity is considered in enforcing the laws triggered during the pandemic. And the best example here is when we first implemented mask orders in late March, early April. The decision was made against public health advice to have police enforce the mask mandate. And what ended up happening is that black and brown communities were disproportionately and more harshly regulated than other communities. The good thing, however, here was that when this was brought to leadership's attention, there was a quick course correction to engage communities in behavior change and more public health informed approaches. And so just to summarize as a wrap up, one, you can't wait for the emergency to begin to pass the laws that will give you the authority you'll need to get the job done. And so I'm very concerned about the short and long-term consequences of things like preemption. Two, we need courageous leaders, both elected and appointed at the federal, state, and local levels to act collaboratively, quickly, and decisively on the authority afforded to them by the law, even in the face of uncertain circumstances during public health emergencies. So the challenge for the field is how to create the conditions that will make that possible and have more people in leadership positions grounded in the science of public health. And then lastly, equity for communities must always be at the center of the conversation when laws are being triggered and enforced during emergencies and non-emergencies. Thanks. Thank you, doctor. That, I think that really helps us see how law, the dynamics play out in the field. So thank you for those examples. And now we're going to move on to Stacy to ask what role does public health play, law play in tribal governance and public health policy, and specifically the use of law and associated challenges during the pandemic? Miigwech, um, Ani. Um, good afternoon. My native name is McKinnick Quay, which means turtle woman. The responsibility that's carried with that name is to speak the truth for all the people. My Anglo name is Stacy Bolan. I am a citizen of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians located in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And I am the CEO of the National Indian Health Board position I've held for just over 17 years. I'm delighted to be here with you today, Miigwech, thank you. There is much to be discussed uh, about um, 
the role of law in tribal governance of public health um, emergencies and public health actions. I want to thank the CDC Foundation for inviting uh, Native voices to the table, not just mine or the National Indian Health Boards, but others. And with that, I'd like to begin. Fundamentally, every discussion of tribes and our interactions with the various levels of government, state, local, national, must be built on the foundation of understanding tribes as sovereign nations, sovereign governments. With a nation to nation relationship that we have with the federal government, there is no inherent relationship between the tribes and state and local governments. That's a very, very important and fundamental reality to understand when thinking about the role of law um, in tribal communities when it comes to public health. There is also a trust responsibility that obligates the federal government to provide tribes with access to resources to handle emergencies such as global pandemics. Uh, this is spelled out in the various treaties between tribes and the federal government. Providing health care, including public health services, was promised by federal officials certified by the United, States, the United States Senate in treaties, which are the supreme law of the land and codified in federal law since the beginnings of this nation. In some instances, treaties were made uh, at long, long, long before there was a United States of America. But our people, um, signed these treaties to achieve peace, to end death and war, and to, and because it was promised to them that in exchange for these lands and all of the riches that go with the lands, we would have, among other things, health and public health uh, services provided to us. It's important to, it is important to remember that the states are not a party to this responsibility or this relationship. Um, it's one of those inherent misunderstandings in the law and the, the way our relationships as tribal nations work that when a federal policy comes down, for example, block grants to the states, say that there's a PPE, um, Congress puts forth a PPE generous uh, appropriation that goes out into the world through block grants to the states, tribes rarely if ever receive any of that funding. Tribes are often included in um, creating compelling arguments for why that funding is needed at the state level. But the states are under no obligation to share those funds with the tribes and rarely do. At the beginning of the pandemic, there were some federal officials who were confused about what it meant to have a federal trust obligation to the tribes. Tribes were often told to work with the state, which was completely inappropriate. It became evident very quickly that there was not a strong understanding of the federal trust responsibility with the federal government, with federal government officials, which is troubling, but also very, very dangerous and how it played out in COVID-19. First of all, tribes are not guaranteed access to the strategic national stockpile. I know that probably seems shocking, but when this pandemic broke out, we had no way to access those, um, those goods so that we could bring personal protective equipment to our people, which was essential to saving our lives. There's no tribal set aside, no accommodating the tribes in the national strategic stockpile. That's something that in the law during the pandemic, we had to fight for, so that would not be a problem in the future. We also ran into trouble with tribal consultation. That is the bedrock of the trust responsibility to ensure, I know that many of us who work in advocacy organizations um, use the phrase, nothing about us without us. That's basically the foundation of tribal consultation, but it is a government to government discussion about any federal laws or policies that will impact the tribes. Tribal nations have to be included. President Biden reinforced that, and that's a good thing. But in the early stages of the pandemic, the government tried to have consultation very, very quickly. When you're talking about 575 plus federally recognized tribes, that's a giant ship that there is no way to move quickly. So the tribes felt that there was a lot of sake of expediency policymaking that was going on that was difficult. Um, but as you go on, 
you see that the long-term relationship with the tribes and the federal government led basically to the crisis that was most poignantly seen and continues to play out in the most severe ways in tribal communities. Because although the treaties are signed, they have long been since signed, and although that is the law of the land, as Supreme Court decisions have affirmed, years and years of underfunding the Indian Health Service, funding at between 30 and 50% of documented need, no funding for a public health infrastructure or capacity in Indian country that was completely overlooked and passed over when the rest of public health infrastructure was being built at other levels of government like local, state, and federal. Um, many tribal communities uh, as a result do not, do not have running water. How do you adhere to the CDC's number one recommendation to prevent yourself from getting COVID? Wash your hands all the time. If you don't even have running water, 27% of tribal homes do not have running water. Many have no uh, sanitation facilities. Yes, that means there are no running bathrooms. Um, there aren't toilets in many tribal communities. Um, tribal communities don't have appropriate housing. Without housing, there is no possibility of health care. Yet our intergenerational commitment is that we will not let our people be homeless to the greatest degree possible. So again, when you have a CDC, um, very well-founded uh, tenant to socially distance, how do you do that in a, a home that was made for a family of four when you have three generations of people living in it, just so that you don't have anyone in your household who's homeless? These create very immediate challenges not just for what we're facing with COVID-19, but in the day-to-day -day lives of our people. We're just thankful that if anything good came of COVID-19, it was to raise awareness about the plight of American Indians and Alaska Natives and to elevate the intolerable conditions to a point where others who are friends and allies share that outrage and intolerance and will work with us to change laws and change the future. Um, I want to give you a couple of examples of how this played out in Indian country uh, and the, the, the innovation that the tribes brought to the table. Um, for a tribe to control its borders in a public health crisis, they have to have tribal law, tribal um, uh, tenets that have been passed by the tribal council that put emergency preparedness operations into effect. Navajo Nation, you saw curfews, quarantining, uh, mandatory testing, and so forth. All of these tribal laws put in place an infrastructure and a web of protection for their people. In the place where those are not existing, other levels of government can come in and assert some kind of control over what's happening on tribal lands. That's not an acceptable um, situation. So what happened in tribal governments that has been evolving over time is the emergence and um, the, the growing sophistication of public health law at the tribal level. One of the places we saw this was in South Dakota with the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. You may remember this because of the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally, which is one of the biggest, maybe aside from the veterans coming to Washington DC on Memorial Day, um, this is one of the biggest motorcycle events of the year. To get to Sturgis, there's one particular highway that runs right through the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. And the tribe felt that it needed to control its borders and have the ability to keep people not um, known to be vaccinated, not mask wearing, whatever the case may be in, in accordance with the tribal standards away from their people. The tribe banned people from traveling through their land to get to the rally. And you might remember uh, the governor of South Dakota, Kristi Noem, was vocally against the tribe doing so. But there was litigation that attempted to force the tribe to take down the checkpoints, but the tribes prevailed. And ultimately, the reason those checkpoints came down is because of tribal law voluntarily taking them down. The Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe was not the only tribe to make such decisions. The Blackfeet Nation in Montana did also. After two months of closures due to the coronavirus pandemic, 
uh, Montana's Glacier National Park reopened its gates to visitors in early June of last year. But the neighboring Blackfeet Nation made an arrangement with the National Park Service to keep the eastern entrances to the glacier closed for the rest of the tourist season in an effort to protect its residents from the state's recent rise in coronavirus cases. You know, what's interesting about this too is that the Blackfeet Nation and the Kootenai Nation, Salish Kootenai peoples of Montana, those tribes first inhabited what is now the 1.5 million acres that would later become and are now Glacier National Park. And though the tribes retains most of their original native plants, animal species, the active glaciers have diminished in number from 150 to 26 over the past 70 years. And this is a result of climate change. Just an interesting fun fact. And of course, I think people are pretty familiar with the amazing job that Navajo Nation did. Um, President Jonathan Nez was uh, and remains just a, a rock star leader of the nation. He came to national attention and really we credit the attention that Jonathan Nez and the Navajo Nation was able to bring to the American Indian Alaska Native experience in COVID-19 and how they uniquely addressed it as really helping elevate the voices of all of the tribes. And of course, um, <clears throat> some of the other issues we have are data. Um, I think my time is probably up. I could go on and on as you can probably <laughs> guess. But I, I want to say have... thank you and okay. stop there. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, there's a lot to say, and you really did give us uh, a perspective on the unique challenges with the tribe. So over to Sarah. Sarah, you've heard, um, you know, themes of equity resonate throughout this, this panel. So from your work and experience, can you give us an example, examples of how law has been used to advance health equity? And if you have time, what needs to be considered for enforcement to be equitable? Sure, thanks Donna and thanks to my fellow panelists and really to the CDC Foundation today for focusing on public health law because as we've heard today, laws are so important to our daily lives and they have a profound effect on our lifetime trajectories. As we've talked about today, they determine program eligibility, give governments permission to enforce protections, and they often determine how resources will be distributed and to whom. It's easy to think about the ways that laws have helped us live longer, healthier lives. The passage of the Affordable Care Act, Medicare, Medicaid, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Acts. But as we've also talked about today, no law is perfect. And in fact, we have a long history, as Stacey has shown us and others today, of using laws to exclude certain groups of people based on their race, their gender, their ability, or other socio-demographic status from the support, services, and wealth building opportunities that we all know improve our health. At Change Lab Solutions, we believe that laws are really powerful tools to help us undo these types of structural inequities. And through our work across the nation, we partner with local and state governments, with community organizations and anchor institutions to help them use the tools of law and policy to advance equity because we know that laws can often be obscure and complex, making it a little intimidating for us to engage in the policy process. But as public health practitioners, we're charged with engaging in law and policy, and we need to do so in order to improve health equity. Of the 10 essential public health services, numbers five and six call out the importance of law and policy. Five, create, champion, implement policies, plans, and laws that impact health. And six, utilize legal and regulatory actions designed to improve and protect the public's health. So here are three steps or three things to think about in order for us to, to start. And again, I'm building on my colleagues' comments today, which is that first, we need a stronger legal infrastructure within public health so that we understand which and how legal and policy interventions work. When we increase public health professionals' knowledge, interest, and ability to use law and also partner with community, which was raised here today, we can improve health and health equity. But second, we need to make sure that individuals within the legal infrastructure are that they understand the role that social inequities and structural inequities play in how our laws are designed, implemented, and as we've talked about, enforced. 
because equities are not just avoidable and unnecessary, right? They're unjust, which means that we have to look at the role that systems and institutions play in creating and reinforcing them. Because when I talk about structural inequities, I'm talking about the ways that cultures, norms, policies, laws, institutions, they all interact in a discriminatory way that perpetuate and intensify the subordination of certain groups across many spheres of their lives. We call these at Change Lab the fundamental drivers of inequities. And when we do our work, we think about and we utilize a framework to help us analyze if the law is going to further inequity or if it's going to help to reduce or eliminate it. So I want to share a couple of examples of how laws and legal concepts are used to both negatively and positively impact health inequities or health equity. And I want to start with preemption, which Dr. Barbo mentioned, because just as a reminder, preemption is the concept that a higher level of government takes away or limits the power of a lower level of government to work on a particular issue. And in itself, preemption is not inherently a good or a bad thing, but it is being used or it can be missed used to do bad things. And research shows that over the past decade, preemption has been used as a tool to thwart equity. For example, local governments are being prohibited from passing local minimum wage laws, expanding affordable access to, to um, housing, for example, and also even limiting broadband access, which through COVID, we all knew were, we, these were all foundational to our health and well-being. So one way that we can help public health officials and practitioners combat the use of preemption is to make sure that they have the understanding and the tools to be able to effectively move, move policies forward. But conversely, I wanna illustrate a couple of ways in which laws is used to advance equity. And one includes the growing number of state and local governments that are instituting paid sick leave policies, which are tied to structural discrimination and income inequality. They help to prevent or help to eliminate those kinds of um, challenges for communities. We know that research shows that paid sick leave helps workers attend to their and their families' immediate needs. They are more likely to access preventative screenings, which we in public health very much um, promote. They seek to, they often will seek vaccinations. And most importantly, they will stay home when they're ill, which reduces exposure to others and really it protects us all. And workers can do this because they're able to take time off and not lose their income. So paid sick leave is one way to address structural discrimination because it also helps to rectify the current and historic exclusion of Black, Indigenous, and other other communities of color from gaining and maintaining wealth. A second example is during COVID, we saw changes to policies and programs that shifted eligibility or eliminated certain kinds of requirements that made programs more accessible to food, to PPE, to other kinds of supports and services during the pandemic, which I think have also raised the question of whether or not those same kinds of um, requirements are still needed in those programs. And I would also say that we need to explore the role that reparations and guaranteed income can also play in redressing multi-generational impacts of slavery, racism, and discrimination across BIPOC communities. When we think about enforcement, I think Dr. Barbo gave a great example of the role in which enforcement can play and actually lead to furthering health inequities by, for example, increasing interactions with law enforcement, which we know will disadvantage BIPOC communities. But another way to think about this is when fines are levied and when they continue to be layered over and over again and have the impact that that can have on low income communities as well. So my last point that I wanted to lift up was, again, raised here today, which is how our public health legal infrastructure can also be strengthened is by engaging communities as partners and as co-creators in policy. So I was delighted to see this as one of the top responses for how to strengthen governance. And that, again, carries over into the way that we can strengthen our public health laws as well. Because we know that even the best laws need the engagement of community and the public in order to inform the development and implementation of those policies. So in sum, we need to create a greater legal infrastructure but we also need to make sure that individuals within that public health legal infrastructure understand the role and the history of structural inequities. And third, we need to make sure that communities who are most impacted by laws and policies are a part of the policymaking process. So Donna, I'll hand it back to you so we can continue the discussion. 
Great. So here is the challenge for the moderator and for the four of you. We have five minutes left. Um, we have a last question. So it's going to be lightning round. It's really one minute each. Okay. So tell us one thing thing that local and state leaders can do to implement or expand the use of law in their public health practice, or one thing that you've heard today that you lift up to prioritize for going forward. I'm going to start with Scott and go around the horn the same way. Go. In one minute, I can say a couple of things, not just one. I mean, one obviously is work with the Network for Public Health Law and the available resources out there that have grown exponentially in the last 10 years to help people find legal solutions. Change Lab Solutions is an incredible resource for anyone who's trying to think about how to use policy wisely. So there is help out there. Another thing that I want to you know, really press is the need for people in public health to take law on as a core skill that they have to master for their jobs. Um, and not just in the sense of understanding their powers, which is really important, as Dr. Barbo says, but also thinking a lot more about the, the sociology of law, the psychology of law. How do we use law to motivate change? It's a tool like our other tools, and it's so potent if we, if we, if we own it. But, but leaving it to the lawyers, it's just never gonna work. Next, Dr. Barbeau. Yes, thank you. Um, and just to build on what Scott said. Um, so from my perspective is looking at how we hardwire equity into the ways in which we operationalize the laws that we're responsible for carrying out. And so to use um, COVID as the example, there are two specific things that I would want us to lift up. And one is um, during the very early stages of standing up an incident command structure, we built in a health equity section that was at the same level as lab and as legal and as monitoring and surveillance. So really looking at the ways in which the structures that we have to carry out public health can be infused with equity and keeping in mind the impacts of the laws that we carry out. And then the second thing is similarly to create feedback loops for us in real time. Um, so we created a community advisory board that were a part of the planning process in terms of maximizing the number of people who could remain safely housed, safely fed, who had their basic core needs met so that they could safely comply with what we were asking them to do in terms of isolation and quarantine. And that without community advisory boards that were representative of the communities most affected, I think our, our response would have taken a very different trajectory. Thank you. Over to Stacy. quick. We have less than a minute here. Join us in our advocacy efforts. Tribes need help. We are only 4% of the population and when we're sick, disease doesn't know borders. Others are sick. We get, we disease just will go where there's an opportunity. So be part of our advocacy efforts in states. If you've got tribes inside of your borders, work with us. We want to work together. Thank you, Stacy. And to sum it up, Sarah. So three quick points. I would say I echo all of my colleagues' comments today. Um, we have to take up the charge to encourage and um, build understanding about law please visit Change Labs Public Health Law Academy on our website. And please reach out to your community members to, as Claude said earlier, build relationships, not just be dating, because community are our partners in this and they need to be centered in our policy making as we go forward. Thank you very much to this great panel. And I turn it back over to Judy. Wow, well, thank you all. That was a very inspiring and energizing um, and I, I, if I heard right, Scott said, don't leave it all to the lawyers, right? So <laughs> we have a few sound bites from today, <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, so keep your uh, comments going in the chat, uh, really terrific. Um, and we're gonna transition now to our last panel of the day. Uh, and this is going to be a panel uh, with reflections on what we've heard uh, and using opportunities to advance public health. So I'll moderate this panel. Uh, we only have about 15 minutes. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Marissa uh, Levine, Professor of Public Health Practice at the University of South Florida, and Joshua Sharfstein, 
uh, professor of the practice of health policy and uh, management uh, at Johns Hopkins University. So we'll be discussing, uh, again, the reflections that we've had. And I will tell you, to, to kick us off, um, I, I, I heard a lot of our speakers speak to this moment in history, uh, and we're building on historical events, but this is this is a, a remarkable moment in history. And I'm reminded of Dr. Bill Feige, who uh, over time encouraged all of us to, to think about being good ancestors. Uh, so I couldn't help but think about that as I hold folks today. Um, I want to start with uh, questions around uh, uh, one of the, uh, I think, uh, comments made that really spoke to many of our, our folks. And uh, Josh, maybe I can start with you uh, on, on the wet cement moment. Uh, that, that really resonated for a lot of folks thinking about this. Um, so do you, um, as we think about our governance, and certainly I, I also uh, welcome you, any, any general comments and reflections you want to make. Uh, but thinking about the wet cement moment uh, with these multiple disasters right now and funding coming and uh, different uh, opportunities, uh, what, do you, what are the immediate uh, opportunities that you think we have to change? Well, um, thanks, Judy. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, yes. great. Um, first of all, I have been watching this this whole day, and it's really just been inspiring. I mean, you can read the headlines in public health and get quite demoralized about things that are happening, but you hear people like the speakers we've had today talk about how they rolled up their sleeves, made connections, brought in partners, you know, done extra work, and really accomplished some great things. And also just the sense of looking forward with optimism and not just with anxiety. I think both of them are appropriate, optimism and anxiety, but but definitely sometimes we don't get enough optimism and, and enough enough sort of direction and leadership. And it was just been a great uh, conversation. Um, so the wet cement moment, you know, I, I teach a class about crises. And one of the big lessons is that crises can lead to major change, but crises don't always lead to major change. And so with my students, we, we think about what are the factors that make the difference? Why did, you know, the um, thalidomide crisis lead to just massive reform of food and drug law, but other crises seem to just sort of come and go? Why do some, you know, horrible episodes of, of gun violence lead to major change, but others people just sort of shrug at? What, what's the difference? Why does it matter? And obviously we're dealing with an enormous crisis now and, is this going to be something that is going to lead to some of the changes people have been talking about for equity, for, um, for, for kind of public health, spreading its wings, making connections, really moving things forward? Or is this going to be sort of a passing phase, which sometimes happens with crisis? And I don't think it's, you know, obvious what's going to happen, honestly. And I think we're actually right now in the middle of sorting this out. And maybe that's what you mean by a wet cement moment or um but i i think that's really the question i think now is the time to for people really to speak out and to be engaged in whatever processes there are about you know the aftermath of, of this pandemic or the current the state of the pandemic it's not over yet but anything that's like looking back lessons learned you know and be making all the points that they were making today i'll just conclude by saying Mobilization is actually one of the factors that really makes the difference between whether crises lead to positive change or not. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. Uh, Marissa, let's, uh, let's turn to you for a moment uh, and, and stay, stay with governance. Um, based on the responses in the chat, uh, we had uh, very, there were some very strong themes that emerged about uh, engaging community partners in message development, investing in relationship building across sectors, uh, and engaging in active listening. Uh, could you talk a bit about how we might uh, use these suggestions and how we better communicate the role of public health or, or better market public health? Certainly, and it's so great to be here with you, Judy, and with everybody else. What an amazing day, and just want to echo what Josh said. It's so important that we come together as a family and, and share these uh, wonderful insights because there's a huge opportunity to move forward that wet cement moment, if you will, the, the windows open and are we, we going to go through it? But I have always enjoyed the family of family of uh, public health. And uh, I just think we have amazing opportunity here. I like to think of the, the book by Nassim Taleb, Anti-Fragile. We could feel very stressed. 
we could feel uh, demoralized, but we have to realize that stress is what gets us to a better place. And we could be better as public health after this. So I think the answer to the question here really comes down to what we individually and collectively need to do in terms of our own mindset. Do we have the right mindset to be able to move forward? Are we able to be the kind of leaders who value relationships? Because it occurred to me that even though we're talking about government finance and legal sectors, these are all social activities and they're not really separate. I think that's really a critical piece about it. So at the root of it, because they're social activities, it's about people and we have to be experts in connecting with people. And that starts with us, with our own mindset, with our own uh, determination about what we're going to do and how we're going to feel. Are we in a growth mindset mode where we can get better? Are we uh, agile? Are we adaptable? Are we being genuine and authentic with ourselves? Um, and do we think more holistically and appreciate that relationships are the key to building the kind of networks that we need to? So every one of those sector speakers talked about the value of relationships and it's going to take us individually valuing them and then acting on them. And I always say to the folks that I teach in leadership, my leadership program, the first and most important relationship is that with ourselves. So it's a great time for us to reflect. And if we can uh, develop that uh, self-relationship to our best ability, then we can reach out and do the things that we need to do. And all of that work is going to come down to effective, positive relationships. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Josh, back to you. So, so thinking about financing, um, when we asked a question uh, in the poll about the American Rescue uh, Plan Act and 20% uh, said it was not on their radar, 36% said thinking about it. So that's a pretty high percentage uh, that uh, obviously not taking action. How is public health, uh, how can the health, public health community I think I lost you for a second there, Judy, but I think I got the question. Um, Marissa, can you hear me? Okay. We can hear yes, you. Yes, I can. Okay, hopefully it's a little clearer this time. Um, so uh, I think the question was the American Rescue Plan and how can we get the, the word out and have people know about it? I think it is something that um, is very important for people to be aware of because it's both the American Rescue Plan, it's also the other um, appropriations that are happening um, that are creating many different kinds of opportunities in public health. And you know, I was recently with the Chicago mayor, um, I heard her give a talk at the US Conference of Mayors and she uh, said that her motto for the pandemic was no temporary scaffolding, that she wanted to use funding to build structures that would really uh, make a difference for her city. And I think that's a pretty good uh, motto for public health that, you know, it can be tempting to do one-time funding that sort of comes and goes, but how do you um, use funding to build something in the direction that people have been talking about today, I think is a really important um, topic. Um, so, I know that looks like Judy has, has dropped off, but oh, wait, maybe we should. <laughs> a question okay. has popped up <laughs> from the internet. Um, Marissa, did you want to comment on that last question while um, the folks start answering this question in the chat? Judy's going to join by phone. Okay, sure. Um, you know, I, I agree. I think there's, I've always felt that my local and state health official roles that there's more than enough resource. We're just not aware of them and we don't necessarily have the connections going back to the, the uh, relationship piece. So I've always thought that if we can build those kind of connections, then my colleagues who I care about and who care about me will, will have my back, so to speak, and I'll be more informed about what the opportunities are in the community. So I think, again, I'm gonna go back to this idea that we have to build robust networks uh, around uh, trusted relationships. Uh, and it's going to take um, the kind of leadership and the kind of individuals in public health who are willing and are to do that and are good at it and appreciate the value. Uh, because uh, as has been said over and over throughout the day, uh, these relationships have to happen before the event. Uh, and that, that just comes back to us so critically during the emergencies. Um, so I know that particularly at the community level, 
This is a lot easier to do. You have to do it at all levels. But I would love to see us have robust uh, local public health with those kind of community networks. And I think that builds our community capacity. And then I'd love to see also that our state and federal partners are in support, fully in support of localities and not undermining the efforts or, op or being obstacles to that. I think that's the opportunity here. And we can't possibly individually know everything that's out there, but with those kind of relationships and networks, we'll be much more informed and we'll, be, uh, we'll, we'll hear about things in a timely manner when we can actually do something about it. So hi everybody. I'm back on. I lost uh, I lost uh, internet. So it just goes to Yay. show we <laughs> just just so you know I had a backup uh, uh, way to connect in case I lost it. So there you go, preparedness. Um, so we've got just a few minutes left here. Um, kind of moving to to back to uh, thinking about law because we've covered our our governance, financing, and law. Um, the audience highlighted three priorities for making public health law more effective and equitable using law to address structural racism, engaging communities in the development of public health law, and evaluating how well public health laws work in addressing public health needs and equitable strategies. So for both of you, from your experience in public health, as public health experts, and you both have been state health officials, uh, you've got the extensive experience in a variety of, of your role, uh, what are some steps that we can take to strengthen or use public health law and also in the chat, I mean, they, they were talking about building more muscle, uh, more, more political muscle, I guess, and more uh, ability to use uh, public health law. So I'll turn that to, uh, I guess, Josh, we'll go to you and then uh, back to Marissa. Great. Um, so I, I found that there were so many good points being made, um, both about the importance of working with communities, education, connections, relationships, like Marissa said, on the one hand, and then public health law a little bit on the other, that this is a very powerful tool. The point I would make is that these two concepts can come together. That um, I don't see, I, I've done many things with public health law in my career. You know, I put, you know, people in quarantine for tuberculosis that, you know, um, which is a very serious quarantine. Um, other kinds of like very serious um, things, we've taken things off the market. We've, you know, and one of the things that I have um, appreciated is that um, I, I don't really like the muscular part of it so much. Um, I would prefer that people are with us when we're doing it and they understand it. And I have come to appreciate that the process of using public health law tools is a community engagement strategy. It actually really gets a lot of attention. And just as a small example, I can tell you in Maryland, when we decided to take um, crib bumper pads off the market, because they were um, involved in some infant deaths and really had no use in the crib. Um, you know, nobody really understood that issue, but we didn't say like, we're strong public health. This is all coming out of, uh, off the market the first day. We actually did um, a public comment period um, and we had multiple hearings. We used every little, you know, regulatory um, law uh, opportunity to get the word out. And every time we did that, we had a full set of safe sleep messages. We had community partners join us in some of these. And it was always not just don't use a bumper, but you know, babies sleep safest alone on their back in a crib. We were really trying to get the word out. And we used the process of eventually taking them off the market as a real engagement strategy and wound up with a lot of people changing sleep practices and substantial declines, both in infant mortality and the disparity in infant mortality related to unsafe sleep. So, you know, to me, like, I, I, I don't want to jump out with like the most muscular move if I can avoid it, but I would like to use the, the ability to, to use public health law to change minds and bring people along. And hopefully by the time you're actually doing something, you've got um, the, the most support that you could possibly get um, for using a public health law tool. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Marissa, and, over to you. Yeah, I would certainly build on that uh, wonderful series of statements by Josh, because as a state health official, I too was very uh, hesitant to use the muscular power of public health law. But I think as we've heard all along today, 
we need to be educated about the law. We need to understand what those laws say we can and can't do. We have to have some understanding about the history because the history is not all good. Um, and we have to appreciate that whatever we do, there will be a response, which is what we're seeing now in terms of uh, many state governments, for example, uh, diminishing the authorities of uh, public health leaders. So I think um, the education that was mentioned in our legal component is critical. I do that with our um, our leadership program. Thank you, CDC. Thank you, Change Solutions Network for Public Health Law. You have all, all have great resources that are critical. But in addition, um, we need to understand what the specifics are in the job that we have. Uh, and then we have to have good advisors and we have to consider public health law, legal practice as a series of stepwise actions, just as what Josh said. That in a sense, I like to think as a leader that if I had to mandate something, it was a failure of sorts. Um, not that it shouldn't be there if absolutely necessary in an emergency situation, but I knew if I used it, I could potentially lose it at a later time, and that's what we're seeing now. So we need to go in as public health leaders and practitioners with the idea that we have to do everything possible not to mandate. And I'll close by saying, we didn't talk about it a lot, it came up though, we're living in a society, the context matters where individual and religious freedoms are huge and to some degree bigger than anything else. And so we better listen and connect because we need to understand what that means for what public health practice has to look like. It will inform what our public health structure needs to look like and our processes and our law. And we're gonna have to be really good and creative uh, and creativity only comes with the inclusion through uh, diversity, and I, I wholeheartedly support that. And I thank all the speakers. I thank our uh, our tribal members for bringing to forefront the issues they have. And Judy, thank you and your crew for putting this together. Well, thank you, Marissa and Josh. You guys were were terrific uh, on our last panel, reflecting on on what we'd heard and how to go forward. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, you know, one thing I did hear uh, as part of the the panel discussions, also that ties in with what I think both of you were saying, is is that relationships build trust, and then trust builds the collection, the collective action, uh, which means we need to engage uh, uh, and and engage with everyone. Uh, so thank you. Well, we have come to the end of our uh, uh, plenary portion of the uh, summit today. Uh, so I do want to thank uh, everyone. Um, first of all, everyone who's participated today and all your engagement and the and everything in the chat. I want to thank all of our speakers and moderators and panelists. And I want to thank our co-hosts, ASTO, NATO, and Big Cities Health Coalition. Importantly, I want to, uh, again, thank our partners, uh, United Health Foundation, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and Pew Charitable Trust for their support for the Lights Camera Action Summit Series. And I thank again all of you for, for your participation. Uh, we had um, 2,200 uh, folks register for the summit. Um, that's uh, the highest number yet for our series of summits. And I think uh, we've tapped into great energy across the public health spectrum. So I hope that we will continue to grow and engage. Um, we have a real challenge in front of us as we all collectively work together to set out the future of public health. And while the challenges behind us and in front of us are very real, we also have an incredible opportunity to develop this new script for public health going forward. So as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, to do this, we must continue uh, to have challenging conversations, be open to diverse perspectives, and explore ways of engaging that might be different from the ways that we've done in the past. I'm very pleased uh, that today's summit, along with the great and thoughtful work that has been developed by so many individuals and organizations will help us in writing this script and preparing our nation not only for future health threats, but for the ongoing health related issues, chronic, infectious and environmental that we all face. We'll follow up with all of you who have registered with summaries of the summits, other materials, and everything will be posted on our Lights Camera Action website, which is futureofpublichealth.org. Um, we do hope uh, that you will join us for other topical uh, for the next summit, uh, actually in this series, which will be uh, March 23rd, 2022. Uh, so a month actually from today, catalyzing cross-sectoral partnerships and community engagement. 
And once the meeting ends, uh, there'll be a brief feedback survey that'll pop up on your screen. Your feedback from summit number two helped us improve how we organized this summit. Uh, we heard the need for more audience input and added the online chat questions and the reflective panel uh, to address responses in the chat and the polling questions. So please take uh, a couple of minutes, share your feedback. We're learning, we're improving as we go forward um, and your feedback is essential. Uh, so you can also send any feedback to future of public health at iphionline.org. And if you received an invitation to the small breakout groups, please find your Zoom link to join us at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and if you need any help with that, again, future of, future of ph at iphionline.org. Uh, I think it's on the slide there for you. Thanks to everyone. Have a great afternoon.